uh, adjacent neurons are connected by these gap junctions, which can be open and closed. And when they're open, they electrically couple adjacent neurons and they open and close depending on pH. And I noted in your work on capnography that when you hyperventilate slightly, you raise, uh, you raise the pH and uh, uh, you get the brain gets a little alkalotic and these things open. So you're gonna get more uh, neurons coupled and enhancing synchrony. These things sticking out are called C-termini. They're little like hairs that stick out from the surface of microtubules and they're pH dependent. And when in, the, in, in a normal pH or healthy pH, they stick out upright. But when you get acidotic or too alkalotic, they shrivel up. So going back to your capnography and, and hyperventilation, mild alkalosis or normal breathing will have these uh, upright and interacting with the environment and uh, if acidosis, they, they shrink and, and, and you lose that. So uh, another, uh, another way that uh, alkalosis and cap, uh, the CO2 levels may regulate mental states by, uh, by affecting these, these C termini. An intracellular or quantum event that's synonymous with consciousness could feasibly directly influence gene expression. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, gene expression changes all the time from various things. So, uh, yeah. It is our honor and privilege to welcome Professor Stuart Hameroff to host a guest seminar for the Institute for Psychosystems Analysis today. Professor Hameroff, MD, is Professor Emeritus in the departments of Anesthesiology and Psychology and the co-founder and director at the Center for Consciousness Studies in the University of Arizona. In the 1990s, Professor Hameroff teamed up with Nobel laureate Sir Roger Penrose to produce the ORCH OR, that is Orchestrated Objective Reduction Model of Consciousness. This proposes at core that an objective reduction of the waveform of a superpositioned neuronal microtubule is synonymous with a moment of consciousness. Based on quantum computing in brain neuronal microtubules, ORCH OR connects brain activity to quantum state reductions at the most basic level of the universe, fundamental space-time geometry, where Penrose has proposed platonic information could influence conscious choices and perceptions. Today, we are surely in a new paradigm of quantum biology, as our students and Young to Live By viewers will know, despite the ongoing climate of skepticism in the wider scientific community about the feasibility of quantum coherence in a warm, wet, and noisy biochemical environment. This view has, of course, been countered by the observation of functional quantum states at the heart of photosynthesis, for example, as well as of supreme importance for ORCH OR, quantum vibrations in microtubules at ambient temperatures. Professor Hamrov and colleagues have designed and are performing definitive experiments to further look for these quantum vibrations in microtubules and test the effects upon them of anesthetic gases, which computer modeling has suggested is the locus of their action with respect to eradicating consciousness. To quote from Professor Hameroff's paper from 2020, ORCH OR is the most complete and most easily falsifiable theory of consciousness, stated with the true spirit of the dialectic. Thus, within this new paradigm, Professor Hameroff's work is both pioneering and preeminent as it represents the only plausible scientific model ever put forward for linking biochemistry with psychodynamics, that is a dynamic model of the unconscious, through quantum physics at the resolution of informational representation at the Planck scale, thus of potential incomparable importance to depth psychology and our work here at IPSA, Professor Hameroff's work is the preeminent scientific bridge towards a non-psychoreductive model of psychodynamics, elucidating the mechanics and scope of the highest resolution of the psychosystems continuum, as based on Professor George Engel's original biopsychosocial medical model, which our students and Young to Live By viewers will surely recognize immediately. In addition, ORCHOR provides a scientific framework for understanding empir empirically observable field phenomena such as synchronicity, the so-called parapsychological, and the so-called transpersonal, 
as well as the self-concept, instinct, complex, core of the psychodynamic psychosystems analysis model. Thus, today is surely to be very special, indeed. For the purposes of record, Steve and Pauline Richards, the founders of IPSA, and 23 of our depth psychology students spread out across the world are in attendance today. So with all of this said, welcome to IPSA, Professor Hamroff. We're really looking forward to hearing your talk today. Well, thank you, James. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege. And uh, let me see if I can load up my slides here. Um, the world out there appears inside our head, Bing, and I use Bing to denote conscious experience, the so-called hard problem, having phenomenal awareness, experience, there are a lot of words for it. Um, it's consciousness. You know what it is. I know what it is. It's just hard to explain uh, it or even describe, but it's having phenomenal subjective experience. So Bing is not intended to be an explanation, just a marker, and we'll try to figure out uh, what Bing uh, actually is and how it, how it comes about. So uh, how we go about that is, is approached through a, a variety of means, uh, starting up here, the neuroscientist. Uh, and it, this cartoon was done by a guy named Stephen Behar, by the way. I use it a lot. I think it's really great. Uh, neuroscientists probe the brain with electrodes. Um, uh, artificial in intelligence people, roboticists try to create machines that are might have consciousness Artists try to capture the essence of, of conscious experience. Physicists uh, study reality, uh, the nature of, uh, for example, Schrodinger's cat, um, uh, which we'll get to uh, quantum superposition. Psychiatrists and psychoanalysts uh, look into the subconscious uh, and uh, the unconscious in various ways. Anesthesiologists, and for some reason, this guy looks like me, uh, study how anesthesia works, meditators uh, uh, introspect and go into their own uh, consciousness uh, deeply, and Western philosophers uh, uh, take various views and standpoints about what consciousness actually is. So it's an interdisciplinary field and uh, approach from many, many different areas, and it seems to me that we need a lot of these, if not all of these areas, to really uh, get a handle on it. So in Western philosophy and neuroscience, the world out there is all in our head, a representation, being, and this could be Plato, the light enters his eyes, and he had this idea that what was out there was actually occurring in his head. And in, in Eastern philosophy, uh, con uh, consciousness involves a deeper level of reality, and being is everywhere. Uh, we kind of awash in a sea of being, you might say. Uh, and this is a sort of Eastern philosophy approaches. Um, but it raises the question of what is reality actually? And this goes back to Plato's cave in Western philosophy. Uh, he had this allegory of prisoners who could only see their shadows because of a fire uh, behind them. Um, and so for them, reality was two dimensions. That's all they knew. And uh, this suggests to some people that our, our reality might be deeper uh, might have more to it uh, than we observe, and that's almost uh, for sure true, at least due to size and scale, and probably quantum also. Um, so we don't really know what, what reality is. Uh, conscious perception may only poor, poorly portray reality, as in Plato's cave. Bing. For him, the shadow is reality, and that's he's having conscious experience of it. And Descartes picked up on this and said that uh, uh, each of us uh, are, could, we could be a mere brain in a vat fed information by an evil genius. For example, this brain is thinking I'm walking outside in the sun. And for him and her, that's as real an experience as we know. And this has led to uh, films like The Matrix and a, uh, a new, uh, I don't know how new it is, idea of um, we're living in a simulation uh, that uh, David Chalmers has now uh, taken up in his new book, Reality Plus, and uh, at least uh, suggesting a 25% possibility that that's what it is, that there's uh, somebody creating uh, uh, our, our world through some simulation. Um, but the point is that both consciousness and reality may, may be an illusion. Um, reality may be an illusion, um, by Plato's cave and consciousness may be an illusion. Of course, modern philosophers uh, 
Neuroscientists tend to think it's an illusion of some sort, and we'll get back to that. But let's get back to the uh, to another question: Is consciousness continuous, or is it a sequence sequence of discrete events? If we watch a video or go to the go to the theater and watch a movie, the film appears continuous, but we know when we think about it that it's actually a sequence of discrete frames, and yet it appears continuous. So, could our own consciousness? be a sequence of discrete frames. And this idea was put forth by, um, among others, Alfred North Whitehead, who said that it is a consciousness is a sequence of discrete events, what he called occasions of experience occurring in a wider field of proto-consciousness. And in, uh, at, in 1993, a philosopher and physicist, uh, Abner Shemini, uh, observed the whitehead occasions were very uh, suggestive of uh, quantum state reductions of specific events. And I use a slide of a, a series of waves crashing uh, on a beach and each one uh, as it crashes or collapses could be uh, analogous in some way to a moment of consciousness. If I had more time and, and better uh, graphics, I'd have put a little bing uh, at, each, at each wave. But the point is that consciousness may well be a sequence of discrete events and specifically a sequence of quantum state reductions. The question is, what causes quantum state reductions? That's yet another mystery. Um, so consciousness could be, as I said, a sequence of collapses of the quantum wave function. We'll come back to that point. So here's my kind of overall view of philosophy, um, uh, different philosophical approaches. Uh, we have the panpsychists, panpsychists who argue or suggest that consciousness is a, a property of matter, presumably a, of, of atoms or quarks or molecules. You don't really say at what level, um, but it's, um, and they have, they face problems like the combination problem, how you get all the individual uh, consciousnesses from an atom for atoms into our unified consciousness. Um, but a lot of people resort to that, including uh, neuroscientists like Christoph Koch, who uh, which suggests to me that the uh, reductionist materialist brain is computer model has failed. And so they have to resort to something else. Uh, emergence, which would include uh, materialism, computationalism, suggests that matter somehow creates mind. It could be an emergent property. It could be a, a computation. It could be, a, it's something that, that, uh, that matter produces. Uh, there are significant problems with that. Then idealism puts mind first and mind in some views are, is all that there is, and matter is a manifestation within this uh, consciousness, within this mind. Dualism uh, suggests that uh, mind and matter are separate and may never be resolved. Uh, and this includes uh, Mysterians who believe that we don't, we're incapable of understanding consciousness, much like a fish could never understand quantum, quantum mechanics, assuming humans can understand quantum mechanics. Um, so dualists kind of separate the two. Uh, and then the simulation idea, as I mentioned, uh, that Elon Musk has been talking about uh, for a while and Dave Chalmers has written about in his new book, which is an excellent book, even if you disagree with the idea, um, that uh, both matter and mind that we experience, including our own consciousness, is a simulation of some, something or somebody else, some entity, perhaps even a deity. Um, and then there's neutral monism, which I think makes the overall the most sense, although it needs fleshing out. Uh, Harold Altmansbacher, for example, has a group that, that favors this, that there's one unitary something, and what that is we can discuss, which gives rise to both mind and matter. And uh, Bertrand Russell, I think, started this uh, neutral monism, and uh, that there's one, one thing, as opposed to dualism, that gives rise to both mind and matter. And uh, this is consistent with our theory, ORCOR, orchestrated objective reduction that James mentioned. And the one unitary thing is space-time geometry, which comprises the universe. And we'll come back to that. And you could think of this as really space-time geometry is all that there is. And matter uh, is uh, particular curvatures and uh, um, configurations and mind comes out of that too. And so due to collapse of the wave function, we get both mind and particular states of matter. So Bing would come out of um, this, this is um, consistent with, with the Oracle R theory, a particular state of matter. 
And one of the problems with panpsychism is that matter can be in superposition of multiple possible states. So it's not enough to just say matter has consciousness because matter at the microscopic level, at least, is, always, is, is constantly changing, going in and out of superposition at the small scale. So this is kind of an overview of different approaches, philosophical approaches. So let's get back to the brain a little bit and uh, uh, the Western idea that the world out there is a representation. And uh, we know from uh, many studies over the years that uh, conscious perception occurs uh, in three waves. So except for smell, all uh, sensory inputs go to the thalamus from the spinal cord, uh, from taste, uh, hearing, uh, and vision through the eyes, which none of these, uh, these are shown, but the eyes, uh, with the optic nerves go to the thalamus. So whether it's auditory or uh, uh, sensory or uh, visual, uh, the image, the information starts from the thalamus. In the case of vision, it goes to primary visual cortex in the back of the brain, V1, it's called. And then um, from there, uh, there's a, it, the information moves to the front of the brain through associative cortices. In the case of vision, for example, to, add, to figure out shape, color, motion, meaning, different aspects of the visual scene. And we get to the prefrontal cortex or frontal areas. And there's a third wave that broadcasts the information uh, to cortex and other parts of the brain. And this takes um, several hundred milliseconds after sensory input. And this is a problem that I'll, I'll come back to in a second. Uh, but the bing occurs with the third wave, uh, which occurs several hundred milliseconds uh, after sensory input. And we know this because only the, the third wave is inhibited by anesthesia. That work was done by, by George Michaud. Um, despite this, we respond to visual inputs in less than 100 milliseconds often, seemingly consciously. So here's Nadal, the great tennis player. And I used to play a little tennis. Um, I wasn't very good, but I, you think you see the ball much closer than, uh, than uh, your, the brain activity in your, uh, going on in your head would, of the ball would tell you. There, seemed to be, there seems to be some kind of disconnect here. And yet uh, uh, Nadal would say that he sees it, uh, uh, maybe not hit the racket. That's what you strive for. Uh, and the same has been shown for baseball and cricket and many other things. So there's simply not enough time. Even rapid fire conversation between two people. Um, if, if you say something, I'm going to respond to you before the activity that you said is processed in my brain, according to the measures that we have for, for monitoring this activity. So uh, this is a problem. And uh, it has led to the conclusion in mainstream neuroscience and philosophy, even though they may not talk about it very much, that consciousness is epiphenomenal that uh, there, there's really, no, we're not in conscious control, at least of rapid fire activities, um, but we think we are, that there must be some non-conscious uh, automatic process going on. And we have a after the fact illusion that we're in conscious control. And this relates to the, uh, the perception action cycle, for example, how, how we react to things. So uh, stuff comes in from the environment and um, uh, for, at the level of the spinal cord, let's say, and goes up into primary sensory, primary lower uh, into the brain, and then uh, upper associative, uh, like I showed before, uh, V1, and then uh, 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 the, the second wave and the third wave, and this leads to action. And uh, this can happen at, at, at many levels. We can have spinal cord reflexes, like the old reflex hammer to the knee or various other things. And that gives you a response, but it's definitely not conscious. In fact, it doesn't go above the spinal cord. And there are uh, subconscious activities uh, that uh, are important in uh, psychoanalysis and psychiatry that occur uh, without consciousness that influence our behaviors. But then there's consciousness at the very top. And that's what we're gonna be uh, primarily interested in, in in how this comes about. Uh, and it, again, the, the problem is it comes too late and yet we think we're in conscious control. So uh, uh, this is the perception action cycle that Walter Freeman used to talk about a lot. He was a consciousness researcher, passed away a few years ago, and, and he would always start with this, and, and it was a good place to start. Um, so how do we get around this problem? Um, I would say, and I'm digressing a little bit because I haven't really introduced quantum mechanics yet, but real-time conscious control 
requires retroactive quantum mechanisms, this backward time effect. And this goes back to the work of Ben Libet in the 70s, uh, showing backward time referral. I'm not going to have uh, time to go into that, but I did write this paper in 2012 about how uh, quantum brain biology, including a backward time effect or retroactivity, can rescue conscious free will. And um, uh, it's my most uh, downloaded uh, paper, by the way. And uh, in, in the last two years, Roger Penrose has fleshed out the physics of how you have, how we have this backward time effect. It's, it's perfectly allowable in quantum mechanics. And we think it's, it, it's operant in the brain to explain Libet's results, many other results, apparent precognition uh, and that sort of thing um, with, with backward time effect. And Roger's done the physics and he's got an article coming out about that, our chapter in a book by uh, Shan Gao, an edited collection on quantum physics and consciousness. I have a, a, a chapter also, as does Chalmers and McQueen about their, their quantum view. So um, I think you need uh, backward time effect for real time conscious control and, and free will. And we'll come back to that point. Now I mentioned that the, going back to the three waves that only the third wave is inhibited by anesthesia, selectively preventing consciousness. In fact, in anesthesia, we use the second wave, um, the first wave and the second wave to, to monitor um, spinal cord integrity, let's say for, for spinal uh, input, for sensory uh, inputs, uh, the surgeons are operating on the spinal cord further down. And we want to make sure that they want to make sure, we all want to make sure that the blood supply and, and the, the spinal cord is not being violated. So we monitor these uh, responses here, um, uh, sensory evoked potentials, for example. And as long as uh, the spinal cord is intact, we see these signals here. Um, but yet the patient's unconscious, has no memory, no, no awareness of, 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 of anything. So um, this also shows that the th it's the third wave uh, that's, that's conscious. And, and this is consistent with most of the other theories of consciousness, including global neuronal workspace, uh, integrated information theory, which both have this broadcast from the front uh, towards the back or towards somewhere. Uh, recursive processing, which, which puts consciousness as kind of the interaction between the backward going and the front and the, between waves two and three, for example, this interaction, recurrent processing. Um, so all of the, the major theories of consciousness other than ORCO are, um, are based on, on this, this sort of scheme. And, but it's basically kind of a wiring diagram of how information flows without uh, addressing uh, deeper issues, uh, which I hope to do next. Um, in, when the information from the thalamus or from other parts of the cortex gets to the cortex itself, um, there are also three waves. And um, cortex is this thin mantle that covers the entire brain. Uh, and because of the curvatures and involutions and convolutions and sulci and gyruses and whatnot, if you opened it up and spread it out, it'd be about the size of a pizza, but very thin. And it fits over the brain, so it covers the entire brain except for the, uh, the cerebellum. And it, the inputs come in three waves. The first wave goes into layer four. From layer four, you go to layers one, two, three, and six. And then one, two, three, and six converge on layer five giant pyramidal cells, these red uh, pyramid-shaped cells, which are extremely interesting and important, um, no matter uh, if you, you know, I, I think they're the most likely place for consciousness. So let's put Bing there. But um, for example, the apical dendrites of pyramidal cells rise vertically and they're all in parallel. And so when we measure EEG from the surface of the brain or, or the scalp, uh, it's mostly coming from these uh, apical dendrites because everything else cancels out because they're going sideways and diagonally. But the apical dendrites are all in parallel and they summate. And EEG comes from dendrites, not from axonal firings. So these are the source of EEG. Um, there are also these, uh, those are the apical dendrites. The basilar dendrites connect the pyramidal cell bodies in this lateral web that when you think about it, spreads out through the entire cortex. And I think it's this web that might be where consciousness actually happens. And, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this horizontal web, this, was, this idea was put forth by uh, Carl Prebrum, that it was in the dendritic-dendritic interactions. And he thought interference in these dendritic-dendritic interactions generated uh, a hologram that uh, 
gener was consciousness or that projected throughout the brain and, and manifest consciousness. And he based this on the fact that memory was distributed. It's, it's not in any one place. Um, based on the work of Lashley, who did a lot of experiments on animals, destroying this part of the brain or that part of the brain to look for ablation of particular memories could never get rid of any particular memory. It was like everywhere. And, um, and so uh, Prebrum came along and said, well, that sounds like a hologram because if you take the holographic plate and break it into a million pieces, each piece, if you illuminate, it gives you the whole image. You just lose uh, uh, resolution. You don't lose any particular part of the image. And finally, the these axons that descend from the pyramidal cells subcortically uh, go directly to the, to the pyramidal tracks in the spinal cord for direct action. So for direct control of behavior. So these uh, pyramidal uh, uh, cells seem to be kind of the final common pathway of, um, of sensory and uh, perception and conscious action. So if you think of the uh, perception action cycle, this would be the, the apex of the perception action cycle in the, uh, the uh, layer five pyramidal cells. So if we look inside the uh, pyramidal cells, um, we see uh, uh, here's the apical dendrite, the basal dendrite, the outgoing axon, and we see the microtubules uh, within them. And uh, uh, each microtubule um, is represented by one microtubule here. And uh, I want you to notice a couple of things. In, uh, the, the microtubules are part of the so-called cytoskeleton, giving structural support to the cell. And in all non-neuronal cells and in axons, the microtubules are continuous. They're not interrupted and broken as they are in dendrites and soma. So when you think about it, uh, your, your femur, your leg bone is uh, skeletal, it supports you, your, uh, your whole body. You wouldn't want it broken and interrupted for skeletal support. So why are, why are microtubules in, in dendrites and soma and only in dendrites and soma throughout all biology interrupted? And not only are they interrupted, they're in mixed polarity. Um, so each microtubule has a plus end and a minus end. And in all other cells, they're all aligned, plus ends together, minus ends together. But in dendrites and soma, they're in these mixed polarity networks. So one is pointing up, one, it's a neighbor's pointing down, and that's how they exist, they coexist. And uh, in our 2014 paper, Roger Penrose and I suggested that because they're, they're all oscillating, and I'll get to that in a second, pretty fast, uh, and they're all in a common voltage, that they're gonna have slightly different en energies and uh, because of the mixed polarities, and they're gonna, this is gonna lead to interference beats. Uh, kind of like in music, when you have two instruments that are slightly out of tune, they'll give a beat at a much uh, lower uh, frequency. And uh, um, interference beats is also part of the, the hologram idea. So uh, the, uh, the, the, mix, the, the interrupted mixed polarity network of, uh, of microtubules in dendrites and soma I think is a, is a key clue that, that uh, needs to be looked at. And uh, Bing, I would say, occurs in the, the network of, of uh, pyramidal cells throughout the cortex. Certainly other areas, um, but if, you had to, if I had to bet on one, I, I'd bet on that. I should also point out that the cerebellum, which apparently doesn't mediate consciousness, and in fact is one of the key features of the, uh, one of the key features of the integrated information theory, is that it supposedly predicts that cerebellar uh, cells would not be uh, conscious because of the way they're hooked up. Um, there's no pyramidal cells in the cerebellum. So that could be the reason. In any case, this is where I would vote for the, the most likely site of consciousness in these layer five pyramidal cells in a network spread out over the whole cortex. But in any case, uh, the, the overall view in modern science uh, is that the brain is a neuronal synaptic computer. And here we have a bunch of neurons and, and this is some, uh, modeled as a no, nodes in a network with interconnections. And this is, the, uh, um, this is based on the Hodgkin-Huxley integrate and fire neuron. And in the 1950s, Hodgkin and Huxley came up with a model, uh, elegant and beautiful, um, based on uh, signaling along the membrane and the cell body and dendrites, slightly different type of signaling, and then the axon uh, signaling by ion channels traversing the membrane. So um, 
it's kind of like a uh, uh, analog to digital conversion from the uh, uh, integration and then the firing um, with, but all mediated at the surface without any consideration of what's going on at a deeper level. And, uh, but it does explain these propagating signals. And um, so we have integrate, fire, integrate, fire, integrate, fire, inter integrate, fire. And this gives rise to, uh, if you take each one of these things as a neuron, the point, long, long thing being the axon and the short things being dendrites, you, we see this kind of chain of signals propagating through a bunch of neurons that could be embedded in a network, but they're 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 serial and uh, one after another, and the uh, the voltage would be in a different time in each part of the of the network. So if we put these together in a little toy network, uh, we can have inputs on the left and outputs elsewhere, and depending on the inputs, we're going to get different outputs. And uh, this is the standard idea in, uh, in neuroscience, obviously a much simplified version, but where's consciousness? Where's the Bing? Uh, but more importantly, where's synchrony? Um, because we know that uh, the best neural correlate of consciousness is most likely gamma synchrony EEG. This is uh, 30 to 90 Hertz, maybe faster. Uh, it used to be called 40, uh, coherent 40 Hertz. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, it's interesting history to this, um, but it was discovered in the 80s and 90s by Wolf Singer and others. And then uh, uh, Christoph Koch and, and uh, Francis Crick jumped on it and said it's the best neural correlate of consciousness. Uh, they were assuming that it was axonal firings causing the gamma synchrony, and they were partial to, uh, to firings. But it turns out that um, uh, EEG in general and, uh, and gamma synchrony in particular comes from uh, dendritic, dendritic interactions um, uh, and that this dendritic synchrony correlates with consciousness. And um, the dendritic synchrony occurs largely due to gap junctions rather than chemical synapses. So we all know about the chemical synapses, but there are also a vast number of gap junctions in the brain which are, imagine uh, this is one neuron and then below it is another neuron. They're connected, uh, adjacent neurons are connected by these gap junctions, which can be open, which can be open and closed. And when they're open, they basically uh, uh, couple, electrically couple adjacent neurons. And they open and close depending on pH. And I noted in your work on capnography that when you, when you uh, hyperventilate slightly, you meditate or hyperventilate, slightly, you raise, uh, you raise the pH and uh, uh, you get, the brain gets a little alkalotic and these things open. So you're gonna get more uh, neurons coupled and enhancing synchrony. And we know that from uh, work from Davidson's lab years ago that meditating monks uh, sent over by the, the Dalai Lama actually have higher gamma synchrony at baseline and especially when they meditate. So it could, it could be due to something uh, related to opening gap junctions. So uh, here's the chemical synapse that we all have come to know and love. And then here's the dendritic dendritic gap junction, which is quite literally a window, uh, opening a window or a porthole between adjacent neurons. And this allows for membrane coupling and could allow for quantum entanglement uh, between neurons too, or tunneling be between these. So it's a different type of connection. And if we have a gap junction in this network that opens, it can grow and, and reach a threshold for consciousness and actually even move around the brain. And raising the question, does consciousness move around the brain? And I think it does because, uh, you know, people have always looked for this, the grandmother neuron or the grandfather neuron, one particular area. And it doesn't seem to work that way. It seems to, uh, be here, there, and everywhere, depending on what you're conscious of. So it could be due to due to gap junctions. Um, Can we just ask a super quick question there? Sure. Um, yeah. So do the gap junctions need to be open for entanglement to be maintained? Well, that's a good question. Uh, maybe not actually, because Anurban Bandyapati's work shows that there can be coupling between adjacent neurons, um, but. Uh, he, I don't think he's ruled out that there could be gap junctions in his system. So we don't know the answer to that. But I would say that um, having them open would, would, would certainly help uh, entanglement 
and recruiting uh, more uh, quantum superposition and uh, increasing the number of, of neurons involved in, in gamma synchrony and also uh, 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 increasing the frequency and perhaps enhancing consciousness. So meditation, for example, you get a little alkalotic, you, you open more gap junctions, you increase your, your uh, EEG uh, gamma synchrony and you feel more conscious or you are more conscious. So that's a possibility. But there could be entanglement without gap junctions too. Um, Okay, and, and that's uh, becoming more conscious then when you're saying that those gap junctions can open. That can be consciousness of any qualia, if I understand the model correctly. Whatever you're conscious of, yes. I mean, whatever you're meditating on or whatever you're observing. Cool, okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, so uh, smell, as I mentioned, doesn't go to the thalamus, comes right in from the nose. And uh, gap junction mediated gamma synchrony in the olfactory bulb cortex right there correlates with conscious uh, smell. And uh, the, uh, the so-called dopaminergic reward system, conscious feelings of pleasure and reward correlate with gap junction mediated gamma synchrony in the dopaminergic nucleus accumbens. So here's the nucleus accumbens and prefrontal cortex and ventral tegmentum and some other areas involve these emotional um, uh, uh, pleasure circuits, you might say, and these are mediated by gap junctions. So um, um, the chemical synapses may trigger it off, but, but then uh, the gap junctions may take over, or could be a combination. But uh, the gamma synchrony mediated by, by gap junctions seems to be important and is usually overlooked. And it goes against the idea the brain is a computer because it's a different type of, of mechanism. So uh, uh, going back to what I said before, the uh, gap junctions open and close depending on uh, pH, breathing, or hyper hyperventilation cause respiratory alkalosis, uh, brain pH uh, uh, increases, and more gap junctions uh, opens, enhancing synchrony and uh, somehow consciousness. So your work on capnography, uh, measuring the, uh, the CO2 in the brain. And we're, we, uh, we, in anesthesia, of course, we watch CO2 uh, very closely um, in, in the breathing circuit, which is in equilibrium with the brain. So um, uh, mild hyperventilation and mild alkalosis is good. You don't want, uh, of course, if you markedly hyperventilate, you, you, uh, you uh, kind of, the, the brain shrinks. So you don't want too much of that unless you're dealing with swelling, but that's kind of another issue. So gap junctions, I think, are probably uh, unsung heroes in the brain. So going back to the uh, neuroscience idea of the brain as a complex computer of simple neurons. Uh, another problem with it is that it's algorithmic, deterministic, and machine-like. There's no apparent room or reason, rationale for consciousness, creativity, intuition, or insight. Uh, and as I said before, it's too late for real-time conscious control and free will. Accordingly, uh, consciousness is considered by mainstream neuroscience and philosophy, even though they don't like to talk about it, as epiphenomenal. And we are, as Huxley bleakly summarized, conscious automata, merely helpless spectators along for the ride. And this is uh, Pac-Man, one of the early uh, video games. Maybe some of you are as old as, uh, almost as old as I am and remember this, this one, but you used a joystick to move this, this guy around who would eat up these, this guy, move him around and catch and eat these guys. And so the idea is that he's being manipulated by someone running the joystick. And in the case of modern neuroscience, they would say that our unconscious uh, auto, autopilot is controlling things and consciousness tags along as a helpless spectator along for the ride. I don't think that's true, um, but, and I'll tell you why uh, shortly. Uh, well, one reason is, is whether or not neurons are really simple threshold logic devices, one or a zero. So the big metaphor analogy between the brain and the computer um, gets rid of the integration, gets rid of everything inside the neuron, just takes the firing as a one or not firing as a zero, and that's supposed to tell, uh, be the brain. So I think that's um, overly simplistic in, in, in several areas. So for example, um, here's what's predicted by the Hodgkin-Huxley integrate and fire model. 
Um, I'll start down here at this one. So I just say it's linear integration. It may, it may not be, but there's a very narrow voltage threshold for firing. So when it reaches this, there, there's, and there's a very narrow temporal window for firing. So firing occurs here. And if you measure, the firing occurs at a slope because it is presumed that the ion channels on the axon open sequentially, this one, then this one, then this one. So there's a slope to it. So this is what Hodgkin Huxley predicts. And this is uh, what you get in computer models also. However, in, in this uh, excellent study in 2006, uh, Nondorf et al., uh, they put uh, in, they used awake cats and put uh, electrodes into the pyramidal cells of awake cats. And rather than the very narrow threshold, they found a very wide threshold and a, and a wide temporal window of firing. So there was some non-computable, non-computable according to membrane, membrane effects, which regulate the firings or the spikes that's not coming uh, from the mem membrane, some other factor. This would be a very convenient place for consciousness to come in and modify otherwise autonomic behavior. I mean, most of the time we're on autopilot, uh, you're driving to work and you may be uh, daydreaming about something else. And then, uh, so you're on autopilot, and then all of a sudden something happens and consciousness takes over. So consciousness uh, assumes control of what was previous, previously auto, auto, automatic or autonomic behavior. So there'd be a very convenient place to come in and to allow for the, the temporal window and the, and, the, uh, and the wide variability in the, in the threshold. And also the, the vertical nature of these uh, could mean that, uh, apparently means they concluded that these ion channels near the axon initiation segment are opening instantaneously and cooperatively. So instead of this one, then this one, and this one, they're all opening uh, simultaneously, which, would imply a quantum quantum effect. Um, this uh, there was a lot of pushback against their conclusion. Uh, people claimed this was just noise, uh, but the problem is that the noise in the pyramidal cell is shown in a study by Christoph Christoph Post group. The noise is correlated. If you measure the the in, inside uh, um, of the uh, near the apical dendrite and inside the pyramidal body, and look at the noise, they're perfectly correlated. And uh, moreover, and I, and I neglected to put this slide in, uh, Anurban Banjapati has evidence that uh, higher frequency activities in the, in the cytoskeleton uh, govern uh, integrated firing uh, more so than do membrane effects. So uh, there's something going on at the deeper level uh, regulating firing, which, uh, which could reflect uh, consciousness. So a deeper level, I'm assuming, because if it comes from outside, it's going to affect the membrane potential if it's an electromagnetic effect. Uh, so it must be coming from inside neurons, or I would, a good bet that it's coming from inside neurons, uh, because you don't see an effect on the membrane potential. So what's inside neurons? Well, uh, cytoskeletal structures. So here's the axon. You can see that all the microtubules are continuous. And here in the dendrites, you can see they're interrupted in a mixed polarity. They're, they're actually the same size. These are uh, further back, um, but they're actually the same diameter as these. But they're in these mixed polarity interrupted networks. And uh, this could influence the firing at the axon hillock or axon initiation segment. So Bing could be in the, in the dendritic somatic uh, microtubules. That's what uh, that's what I think anyway, or that's what I'm, what I'm betting on. And this is analogous to something that's come along in AI the last uh, 10 years or so called deep learning, and uh, <laughs> which they claim uh, makes uh, uh, AI more like, more like us. And in, in deep learning, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So you start with a simple, uh, this is an AI now, you have a simple neural network, uh, which has one hidden layer and you add additional hidden layers and, when, and then to an output layer. Uh, and when you do that, you get interesting effects. Anil Seth has done a lot of work on this. Um, but before I show you what he found, these are serial at the same scale, but they do cause mixed contexts in imagery suggestive of psychedelic mental states. So when Anil and his uh, co uh, collaborators put a, uh, additional networks 
in an AI system, uh, they got you know weird effects that uh, could be construed as what uh, as hallucinations or what are seen in in the mental imagery of psychedelic states. For example, uh, puppy dogs coming out of a plate of spaghetti, or eyeballs uh, coming out of of uh, the Mona Lisa, things like that. And he's got a whole string of such images um, due to a, a, a additional hidden hidden layers in a neural network. Could the uh, mic, could this be uh, at a, the hidden layers occur in the brain at a deeper level? Uh, this would seem to be even better because um, um, you'd save time. You wouldn't have to go from network to network and it could, it could act, each layer could have hidden layers in the, within it. For example, here, was that a question? No, okay. Um, so the idea is that deeper, faster quantum processes occur in the cytoskeleton and, uh, and give rise and, and influence uh, uh, firings and to control behavior. And this is uh, uh, consistent with the model that Roger Penrose and I developed of a uh, scale invariant hierarchy. Um, now, most people would say there is a scale invariant hierarchy. We're starting with the neuron here. This is a different uh, version of the pyramidal cell. Um, and most go upwards in scale to the, to the left of the screen, up to networks of neurons and networks of networks and up to the whole, whole brain. And there, are, there is some scale invariant uh, fractal-like uh, uh, effect seen in the EEG going upward. But we can also go downward into the uh, into the the microtubule networks and the microtubules and into these dipole oscillations that I'll tell you about that have faster uh, uh, oscillations, uh, uh, a thousand hertz, a million hertz, a billion hertz, and uh, we go even further down into the uh, the tubulin, ten to the twelve terahertz dipole oscillations, petahertz and further down in, into uh, the atomic nuclei being in quantum state. This gets, from here down, we get into the quantum state. And eventually, uh, according to Roger Penrose, down to the fundamental level of space-time geometry. But notice there's a big step here between 10 to the 18th and 10 to the 43rd uh, hertz. 10 to the 43rd being uh, the Planck time, or 10 to the minus 43 seconds is the Planck time. So, um, we have this idea that there's a multi-scale, a scale invariant hierarchy that goes from the whole brain, which you can't see because it's further to the left, uh, down through networks and smaller networks, and then to, to neurons, and then further inside, faster, smaller, going all the way down, and then the big jump down to, uh, down to the, the Planck scale, uh, connecting us to the fine scale structure of the universe, which was Roger's uh, original idea. So, uh, okay, well, maybe, can the cytoskeleton process information? That's, you know, we have to assume that it's a, capable of intelligent, at least information processing that could give rise to consciousness. Otherwise, it's not, its influence is not gonna be very useful. And there's some pretty good evidence for that. Um, now, most people view uh, cognition and consciousness as emerging from complex computation among simple neurons, but yet the single cell, uh, organism like a paramecium can learn. It can avoid predators and obstacles as we see here. It can find food. It can le learn if you suck it into a capillary tube, it escapes faster each time. It can find a mate shown over here and have, have sex. Uh, and yet it doesn't have any synapses. It's only one cell. So this is a bit of an X-rated uh, image of two paramecium having sex. And the only time they're absolutely still is when they fuse and actually uh, don't move for uh, many seconds or, or a minute. And could be, I don't know that they're conscious, but they could be. Uh, in our view, any, any, uh, any organism can be conscious, would just be at a lower frequency and a lower information capacity. So maybe. And they, uh, the, how do they do that? How do these organisms uh, have cognition? Much, you know, we won't worry about consciousness for the moment. And they do so through microtubule based structures called cilia. So if you look over here, you, you see these little hair like things uh, that act both as sensors and, and ores or motors to move, move these guys around. So here's a better image. We see these things sticking out. And if we do a, uh, a cross section, well, here, here's one coming out of a, of a cell here. If we do a cross section of the cilium, 
we see it has these nine doublets of microtubules. And here we see them here also, and with a central pair. And this is a centriole, uh, which is a very similar structure. They're all uh, nine triplets, but no central pair. And uh, these uh, bend back and forth here to, uh, to be deformed by hitting an object or to move the, move the organism. And I should also mention that these are also the same size as photons, uh, about a, 150 nanometers in length and up to a micron uh, in diameter and a micron in length, and do act as uh, photo detectors um, in, in, in some cells. So, and, and may do so in our brains um, in terms of primary cilia and so forth, but uh, we'll come back to that. So, um, so uh, this is, let's look in on a cilium, like on a paramecium here. So this, this thing's gonna bend back and forth. So how does it do that? Well, it, it, most likely there's a signal going along this row of tubulins. And when it comes to this motor protein, this is called dynein, and this uses ATP to actually contract. First this one, then this one, then this one, as the signal propagates so that it moves in an organized fashion. So here are these uh, uh, ATP molecules or these dynein molecules burning ATP to control the the uh, rhythmic and, and functional uh, bending of the, uh, of the cilia. And this is how a, a little paramecium gets around. Well, these same structures, these exact same structures actually organize the interiors of brain neurons. Um, here's dynein, there's, there's two major uh, motor proteins, dynein and kinesin. So the problem is, so here's a neuron, this is the axon, this is the dendrite. And the problem is that synapses out here, say, need various stuff, enzymes, uh, receptors, uh, precursors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. On the axon side, you need the neurotransmitters. Uh, and um, these things have to be synthesized in the cell body and then transported to a particular synapse for synaptic plasticity. And how does that happen? Well, the microtubules, which in a dendrite, again, are interrupted, uh, these motor proteins, kinesin, quite literally walk along or run along actually uh, the, the uh, microtubule and carry uh, cargo, with, say this thing here, and this has to be delivered to a particular synapse somewhere here or maybe somewhere here. And now how does the, how does the motor protein know where to get off to deliver its cargo? It appears that this microtubule associated protein tau, which is important in Alzheimer's disease and various neuropathies uh, um, is a traffic signal and tells the motor protein where to get off, where to jump off and deliver, deliver your, your uh, cargo to this particular synapse here. And uh, also they, these things have to jump from microtubule to microtubule and know to go left or right at bifurcations. And it looks like the tau, the placement of the tau on the microtubule is an encoding of telling the the motor proteins were to get off to, uh, to accomplish uh, uh, synaptic plasticity, uh, which is the uh, presumably the basis for learning and uh, adaptation. Um, and this leads to a whole uh, Pandora's box of problems in uh, mental and cognitive disorders that, uh, that can occur due to uh, problems with the microtubules and the cytoskeleton. Um, so for, I forgot the reference, the reference. I'll, I'll send it along. I, I found a, there's a great uh, paper from 2016 on, on uh, the cytoskeleton in psychiatry. And it just goes on and on about various problems with the cytoskeleton that, that are associated with uh, in animals usually, but also in humans, uh, various uh, cognitive and disorders. So for example, um, um, this, uh, uh, Kinesin uh, motor, I just showed, showed it to you, uh, conveys this, uh, this enzyme CRMP2, which is important for actin bundling. Now, actin is another cytoskeletal structure, and it, it kind of wraps the microtubules and organizes the cytoskeleton in such a way that they're functional. Um, and in a, in a proper morphology of a neuron, uh, the F-actin is nicely bundled and the microtubules are, are, are well organized in the normal condition. But there's a, uh, so here's, here's what I just showed you, uh, high CRMPT activity, proper morphology. But um, it turns out that uh, 
there can be defective transport or multi multimerization and uh, you don't deliver the uh, CNR MPT properly and you get dispersed, dispersed F actin and that is thought to uh, cause misshapen and abnormal neurons which are found in schizophrenia. So uh, uh, in uh, pyramidal, I think it's in pyramidal neurons, I'm not entirely sure, but in neurons of schizophrenics, uh, I think in postmortem studies, there's a lot of misshapen and, and abnormal looking uh, neurons that could be due to this uh, dispersed F-actin uh, bundling. And this was from a uh, group, uh, Hirakawa. Hirakawa, I've been following for, for decades, has done amazing work on the cytoskeleton and is recently um, relating it to uh, various psychiatric disorders. So that's one example of a disease of the cytoskeleton um, uh, due, to, due to transport. Now, then there are many, many others uh, due to these high molecular weight microtube associated proteins and other things that, that relate to uh, dendritic architecture changes, uh, depressive phenotypes and in, in, uh, low anxiety, low depressive phenotypes and depression due to, um, due to these, uh, the lack or, or abnormal function of these various microtube associated proteins. And there's many, many of these in, in that article. Um, another uh, disease that, of the cytoskeleton, I would say, is Alzheimer's. Now, everybody pays attention to the amyloid plaques that are outside the neurons, but uh, the cognitive dysfunction seems to correlate with uh, the neurofibrillary tangles uh, shown here, uh, in, which are tau. So tau, as I mentioned before, uh, was the traffic signal on the microtubules, but also stabilizes the microtubules. And here you can see the tau in this part of the microtubule that, that is still intact. And um, the microtubule is, uh, is disintegrating. Now this could be because the tau is dislodged and, and, and all the tau clumps together in these neurofibrillary tangles, or it could be that the microtubule is unstable and disintegrates and that dislodges the tau. But in either case, um, you get misshapen, uh, abnormal uh, disease neurons, and eventually the microtubules disintegrate, you get the neurofibrillary tangles, and you get loss of microtubules, loss of synapses, and the brain eventually shrinks because everything's retracting. You lose the microtubules and all the neurons have to get smaller. And this is also similar to something we see with serial uh, anesthet anesthetics, at least uh, in animals, it's debatable in, in humans, although I, I think it's probably true, post-operative cognitive dys dysfunction, because too much anesthesia can, uh, I mean, way too much can cause uh, disintegration of microtubules. I don't want to alarm anybody. Uh, anesthesia is quite safe, but sometimes people need like 20, 30, 40 operations over the course of a year or two. So that's when we run into that. So <clears throat> Alzheimer's seems to be related to uh, uh, a problem with microtubules, <clears throat> which brings up the case of memory. <clears throat> so <clears throat> most people would say the membrane is in the uh, uh, synaptic plasticity. This is the famous long-term potentiation LTP model of memory where you have uh, high frequency stimulation of the uh, axon causing prolonged sensitivity at the synapse of the dendrite um, but these proteins that mediate the sensitivity are transient and only last hours to days, and yet memories can last lifetimes. So it seems likely that memory is stored at a deeper level. And one possible mechanism is through this CAMK2, calcium calmodulin kinase 2 molecule, which uh, we know latches onto microtubules, uh, but that's about all that is known for sure about, about it. Um, but Interestingly, the CAMK2 is a uh, hexagonal snowflake-shaped molecule, uh, which without calcium is, uh, so remember that uh, calcium is going to come in when the, when the synapse is activated. Without calcium, it is flat and in a disc shape. So we're looking at the top view here and the side view here. When calcium comes in, these kinase domains, six on top and six on the bottom, sprout up. And it forms this uh, kind of weird uh, nano poodle type of structure with, with six heads and six feet or whatever, however you want to call it, with these phosphorylation sites, 
which can phosphorylate something, which should be a, a marker, give it give it energy. So when when we looked at this, or when I looked at this uh, uh, years ago, uh, well, I, I'm asking myself, what does this have to do with memory, and where is this going, and what's it phosphorylating? And the hexagonal lattice reminded me of the uh, uh, the hexagonal shape reminded me of the microtubular lattice, and so. Uh, with my colleagues, Travis Craddock and Jack Tusinski, we modeled the interaction of CAMK2 with the microtubule. So here's the A lattice. And by the way, uh, these things sticking out are called C-termini. Uh, uh, let me just say that um, they're little like hairs that stick out from the surface of microtubules and they're pH dependent. And when in, in, in a normal pH or healthy pH, they stick out upright. But when you get acidotic, or too alkalotic, they shrivel up. So going back to capnography and, and hyperventilation, uh, mild alkalosis or normal breathing will have these uh, upright and interacting with the environment. And uh, if acidosis, they, they shrink and, and, and you lose that. So uh, another, uh, another way that uh, alkalosis and cap, uh, the CO2 levels may regulate mental states by, uh, by affecting these, these C-termini. But the point here that I want to make is, is something different. And that is that the CAMK2, if, if you see this overlay, matches exactly the hexagonal uh, lattice and size of the, uh, of the microtubule, whether it's the A lattice or the B lattice. And I won't go into the different, you know, why uh, A lattice is, uh, has a Fibonacci geometry. And um, anyway, I won't go into that now, but uh, the CAMK2 can bind to both. So it could be that in memory formation, a CAMK2 uh, lands on the microtubule and its six kinase domains interact with six tubulins and phosphorylates them uh, or some of them. So you have up to six bits of information being imparted to a microtubule uh, with each CAMK2. And there's hundreds or thousands of CAMK2 involved in each synaptic event. So this can impart a uh, memory that gets encoded in the microtubule. Now each tubulin can be one of 22 different isozymes, can be phosphorylated or not, can have uh, post-translational modifications. So the memory ca storage capacity in microtubules inside the neuron is incredibly huge. Uh, uh, it's something, and there's about a billion tubulins per neuron. So a billion raised to the power of 22 or something like that, or 26, if you count the, the other things. So just a vast amount of inter information. And the last point I want to make about this is that the microtubules in dendrites uh, are, are uniquely uh, poised to host memory. In all other cells, the microtubule, which, which divide, microtubules may be doing something structural, but then for, when cell division happens, they depolymerize, their microtubules are their tubulins are repurposed for mitosis for cell division, and then they, and they do that, and they go back to doing what they were. But any uh, any arrangement of how they're located with with relation to their other tubulins is lost. In neurons, neurons don't divide, so they never have to do that. And the neurons and dendrites are capped at both ends, so they don't do what's called treadmilling. They lose some at one end and gain them at the other. They're quite stable over presumably a lifetime, and so can encode memory. Uh, in, in dendritic uh, microtubules. So uh, I would vote for uh, dendritic microtubules as a site of, of memory. So can I ask a super quick question there as well? It, it looks to me like there's a potential platonic element there. So you can't see my cursor, but you've got those, those six yellow dots on the bottom microtubule. If, you, if they were to be moved, say, somewhere up or down, say left to right from where we're looking at the screen, would there be potentially a different qualia, so-called, that would be there? hence different information within different memories? Uh, potentially, you know, uh, or uh, any of the other uh, variables would affect the qualia too. I mean, uh, we don't know how many potential qualia there are, but I'm sure there's a lot and there's a lot of potential. So any, any um, uh, but this is, we're just looking at one microtubule. And I, and I think uh, you need a lot of tubulins entangled to, to have a conscious moment, the kind that we have uh, quantitatively. But I would say when the, when the collapse occurs, the, the states that are selected uh, uh, among all the tubulins would, would determine the, the, the content of the conscious moment, including the qualia. 
cool. So would would the phosphorylation domains there, would they influence the gravitational component in the orc OR? So the actual mathematical variables? Uh, yes, in principle. Um, we'll come to that. Um, uh, let, let's come back to that. I'm not sure I can answer that question even when we get to it. But, okay. but in principle, yes. I'd have to ask Roger about that. Okay, thank but, you. Uh, uh, I, I would say if this is the mechanism for consciousness and, the, and that model is right, then they have to, in some sense, uh, affect, uh, affect it down to that level. And by the way, here you see the uh, C termini sticking out. So this is a healthy microtubule. If it was acidotic, they'd be all flattened and shrunken up. That was a way of avoiding your question because I don't have a good answer. That's all good. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so uh, so what? Can microtubules process information? So when I got interested in microtubules, uh, actually in the 70s and then the 80s, uh, I was just learning about computers, which were new to me then. And, uh, and I, I, read, I was trying to figure out how microtubules, they had this grid-like lattice, which could be, a micro, could be something like a, a computer. And I read about, I, I started, I went to a meeting at Los Alamos about cellular automata and met uh, my colleague, Steen Rasmussen, who did this work. And uh, the, the Game of Life was a famous cellular automata put forth by Martin Gardner in Scientific American in the 1980s, kind of the simplest form of computation. And it really was revealing in terms of what, uh, what computers could do from basic ideas. You start with a uh, orthogonal grid and every square can be either alive or dead in the Game of Life. And, and then there's um, sequ sequences of, uh, of, of events. And at each, at each transition, there's a calculation made. And, and the simple calculation is if, if this guy's alive and has two or three neighbors that are alive, it will be alive in the next generation. So life generation. And if you do that, uh, you get pattern, uh, very simple, you get patterns that move through the grid and can do computation. And people uh, show that you could, you could simulate differential equations if you had a big enough cellular automata. So starting with something very simple, going only by uh, nearest neighbor rules, you got fairly interesting uh, computation. And uh, so Steen and I uh, modeled the uh, uh, microtubule as a, as a cellular automaton, cellular here meaning cell as the fundamental unit, like a biological cell, but we know now, or I think that cells are way too complicated for that. So in this case, the tubulin is the cell, the fundamental state, and just going by nearest neighbor uh, interactions and depending on the coupling, you get patterns that move through the lattice, through the microtubule lattice, wrap around, so you get interesting effects through the wraparound effect on the cylinder, and you can, you can process information. So we showed that in principle, based on dipole oscillations, uh, that microtubules could process information. So uh, we published a bunch of stuff. I, I first published on this with Rich Watt in 1982 in the Journal of Theoretical Biology. I wrote a book about it in 87. Uh, the paper with Steen uh, put it, uh, was the best scientific approach to that. And uh, another paper with Jack Trusinski. And then uh, with Roger, uh, we did uh, quantum computing that, that I'll come to. But the basic idea is that microtubules can process information and have a, have a high capacity. So for example, um, if you think of the brain as a bunch of neurons interacting, uh, uh, and this came from the AI people or the singularity, actually first from a guy named Hans Moravik in 1986. And then Ray Kurzweil uh, took it up uh, with the singularity. Uh, basically saying, okay, we have about 10 of the 11th neurons per brain, uh, about a thousand synapses per neuron, about operating at about hundred Hertz, roughly. This gives 10 to the 16th operations per second per brain. So Moravik and then uh, Kurzweil said, okay, when we have a computer that can do 10 to the 16th operations per second per brain, it will uh, be equivalent to the brain and therefore do everything the brain can do, including consciousness. Well, I think they've probably surpassed that by now, and, and there's no conscious computers that, that I know of anyway. And, uh, but in the 80s, I was going around to neural net and AI meetings, being kind of a, a fly in their ointment or a thorn in their side saying, no, 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 this doesn't work. You have to look at the information capacity at a deeper level. 
So, uh, so I was telling them, well, okay, we have the same 10 to the 11th neurons per brain, but each neuron has 10 to the 9th tubulins, a billion tubulins, and each of those are oscillating, switching at about 10 megahertz. I'll tell you why I came up with that number later, but, and this gives 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron. So the same capacity as you guys are saying, not you guys, but those guys were saying at the whole uh, brain uh, and 10 to the 27th operations per second per brain. So, um, you know, they didn't like that too much because it was pushing their goalpost way, way downstream. And, you know, they were saying, you know, give us another couple billion dollars and we'll have a conscious computer for you. And I was saying, no, it's going to be at least 20, 30 years um, to get to this level. Um, but then one, one day somebody said, okay, wise guy, uh, how would that explain consciousness? And I had to admit uh, that person was right. Um, where's consciousness? Where's the being? Is something else required? And could that be quantum physics? And uh, I say that because this, this person, and I unfortunately can't remember who it was, but I'm, I'm grateful, suggested I read a book called, uh, by Roger Penrose called The Emperor's New Mind about quantum physics in the brain. And so I did. I, was, I, I, I took this criticism quite seriously. I had become a reductionist um, and, uh, uh, you know, microtubules were cool, but how did they explain consciousness? And I didn't know. So I read uh, this book, which I would still recommend, um, The Emperor's New Mind Concerning Computers, Minds, and the Laws of Physics by Roger Penrose. And the emperor, I think, was intended to be Marvin Minsky, the, the, uh, the big shot in AI, who was uh, going around saying, yeah, we can, you know, we'll have conscious computers. The brain's just a computer, uh, blah, blah, blah. That's all there is to it. And, uh, and of course, the fable was that uh, the emperor, some little kid pointed out the emperor's naked. He was giving, uh, he was told he was wearing the elaborate clothes. But anyway, so Roger's basically calling out AI in a very not so subtle way. And the first half of the book was about Gödel's theorem about how you needed something outside computation to be for consciousness, that a mathematical theorem could not be proven by itself and needed a, a mathematician or, or something else outside the system to prove it. And he likened this to understanding. To understand something, you needed to, well, understanding is kind of a feeling and you needed to have a, be outside the system to understand it. But what was outside the system? That was the problem. And uh, in the second half of the book was about quantum physics and how and collapse of the wave function or quantum state reduction, which was yet another mystery and how the solution to that mystery could be the solution to consciousness also. So I hadn't paid much attention to quantum physics at that point, the early 90s. But um, I'll, I'll kind of tell you what I learned in a nutshell, which is that the world is divided into two realms, the quantum realm and the classical realm. And the classical realm, we recognize everything is in one place. It's localized, particle-like, and fairly large. However, we, we know or, uh, that at, the, at small scales, things could be in superposition, quantum superposition of multiple locations or possibilities at the same time, non-local, wave-like, and tended to be small. But how small uh, was unclear. And it appeared that quantum properties could indeed help explain consciousness. Uh, one was Roger's non-computability, but also the unitary nature of cognitive binding and sense, sense of self uh, could depend on uh, uh, quantum coherence and entanglement, where everything is, is quite literally one entity. If you perturb one part of a quantum system, you perturb the whole thing. Uh, the the abrupt uh, transition from unconscious to subconscious possibilities to consciousness and causal selection uh, actions and perceptions is quantum, could be quantum state reduction. In other words, you have multiple, what am I going to have for lunch? Blah, 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 blah. Ah, I'm going to have uh, a tuna fish sandwich. So all those possibilities are in superposition and then I collapse on super, uh, one particular thing. We do that all the time. I mean, that's kind of what consciousness is. We're taking possibilities and collapsing to one to one possibility. Also, the, the, hard, the hard problem of phenomenal experience as an intrinsic feature of space-time geometry. You know, panpsychists say, well, it's a fundamental 
uh, feature of the universe. Uh, even Christoph Koch says that now. Well, um, but matter isn't really fundamental. Uh, quantum is, and so uh, I think this gets down to the most fundamental unit. And uh, the other thing that I mentioned earlier is that real-time conscious action uh, depends on uh, quantum backward time effects and temporal non-locality. So there were a number of reasons, uh, in addition to Rogers' non-computability, that uh, quantum mechanics could help explain consciousness. And uh, it could be actually that consciousness quite literally is the interface between the quantum and the classical. And uh, I, I got this idea from somebody who had studied Kabbalah and pointed out that Kabbalah said that there are two worlds, a, a, a world of uh, uh, aggravation and strife and a world of bliss, blissfulness. Life. And uh, consciousness danced on the edge between the two. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but, but um, it's true that uh, whether you believe in the, the Copenhagen interpretation that I'll come to or the Penrose interpretation, the consciousness is the kind of the, in, the on the boundary between the, the quantum and the classical. So for example, um, this is a cesium atom. You'll have to take my word for it in its particle shape. And this is its, its waveform in, in the background. So we know that in quantum superposition, this particle can exist as a wave of multiple possibilities. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, and it's here. Or in its uh, classical form, it's only here. So this illustrates quantum superposition. It can be either a wave or a particle in a definite state or location. But we don't see quantum superpositions in the world we experience. I mean, the atom we're not gonna see because it's too small, but with the proper instrumentation, but um, it seemed to early quantum pioneers or around the, the start of the uh, 20th century that the very act of measurement or conscious observation seemed to cause multiple possibilities to reduce or collapse to definite states. This is called the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Uh, Niels Bohr and then uh, Wigner von Neumann uh, came up with this as a pragmatic solution. They didn't really know why the superposition went away, but it seemed like when you looked at it, it went away. So um, they said, well, consciousness causes the collapse. We're going to go on and work with the equations and the, and the physics and develop electronics, which fortunately they did, without worrying uh, about the underlying reality. Einstein was very concerned about the underlying reality, but um, uh, others, uh, uh, Bohr, and, Bohr and Wigner and von Norman just proceeded to do uh, quantum physics. Um, Fortunately, so, um, but it's still, it's still an enigma, but there's a more fundamental question, which is how can a particle actually be in multiple locations simultaneously? And this is where Roger came in, in, in his book, uh, The Emperor's New Mind. And he accounted for superposition through Einstein's general relativity. Well, uh, physicists tell us that, that re general relativity and quantum mechanics don't mix. Uh, the different equations, they're irreconcilable. Well, Roger uh, reconciled them at least conceptually. Uh, he started with general relativity, which Einstein had told us uh, more or less equated mass. Here's the sun, very big mass, and it's space-time curvature. And he said that, that, uh, the, that light would follow the curvature and that a a star behind the sun that we wouldn't normally see, uh, we would it would appear over here because of the curvature of space time because we would only see it on this lap. And in 1919, Arthur Eddington went to a mountaintop during the eclipse and proved that this was actually true. Um, but what about matter and space time curvature at small scales? So Roger uh, developed these two dimensional space time sheets because it's hard to draw uh, three or four dimensions and then show stuff like this. So here's uh, three dimensions of space and in one dimension back here, and here's time moving forward. So here's a particle. This particle is equivalent to this curvature in space time. So if, if it's gonna move over here, this is it moving over here. So a particle oscillating back and forth between these two, these two locations would be equivalent to uh, oscillation of this curvature, space time curvature uh, back and forth. And uh, superposition were opposing curvatures. So you had both curvatures over here in coexistence and, and the particles in two places at the same time. 
due to a separation in fundamental space-time geometry. Now, you know, what space-time geometry is actually made of uh, is unclear to say the least. Roger's probably the world's expert on this. Uh, he started with spin networks and how there's and uh, um, so this was his idea that superposition was a separation in fundamental space-time geometry. Here's the, here's the same picture. Um, but why don't we see superpositions in our perceived reality? And the, uh, the idea that consciousness collapses the wave function from Bohr, von Neumann, Wigner, known as the Copenhagen interpretation. So here's conscious observer over here, bang, uh, looking at this and uh, he or she causes this curvature to disappear, there's no particle there. This one continues, so consciousness has caused uh, collapse of the wave function. This was the this is the uh, uh, Copenhagen view or the uh, uh, subjective reduction, we'll call it subjectivity here, causing uh, uh, quantum state reduction. Now, if the separation were to continue, if there were no collapse, you would get multiple worlds, and you may be familiar with the multiple worlds hypothesis. That there is no uh, collapse and every super every possibility continues and evolves its own universe and despite the apparent messiness in that uh, it, it's quite a, a popular view roger said however that these superpositions are unstable and will self-collapse and undergo objective reduction at time t equals h bar planck's constant over two pi over the uh superposition uh separate separation uh uh, so, uh, gravitational self-energy. This is where gravity comes in. It's, re it's really just space-time geometry. This is the amount of energy required to separate something from itself. And we, can a we actually calculated that for, for tubulin. Um, he said when, this, ha when this, this threshold was reached, this one would cease to exist, this one would continue, and there would be a moment of phenomenal experience. Bing. So this was his uh, proposal for the uh, for, uh, genesis of of qualia of subjective conscious experience or proto conscious experience, if it was random, that uh, uh, coming from the Planck scale when this th threshold was reached. So for a very uh, large E sub G, this would be uh, short and brief. A small E sub, e sub G, like one particle, would take a long time. Um, uh, and the intensity of the experience would be related to the amount of superposition. So a single particle uh, collapsing would have a very low kind of boring uh, moment of experience, but it would be a moment of experience. So the point is that rather than consciousness causing collapse, it, it, Roger proposed the, the, the complete opposite, the collapse OR causes or is consciousness. So Bing would occur when uh, this threshold is, a uh, superposition reaches this threshold. And here's the subjective reduction, and this is objective reduction, the objective threshold being uh, this threshold here. Now, uh, in the random environment, uh, this would be uh, called decoherence. Such OR events would be isolated, and their experience would be random. They would be what Roger calls proto-conscious. They would be uh, kind of, it kind of like the equivalent in panpsychism of the consciousness of a, of a single atom that was not connected to anything else. Uh, but it would be, it would have a, a subjectivity, it would have a, a quail, qualia, but random, without meaning, without memory, presumably coming and going. Uh, I like the metaphor of uh, this would be like going to the symphony and, and the, the musicians are tuning up their, their uh, instruments uh, so you hear the notes, tones, and sound of an orchestra warming up. It's noise or a cacophony. So each of those sounds would be like a proto-conscious moment, if uh, me metaphorically. But then the, the orchestra plays, and that's music. So uh, what we want is something that can organize or orchestrate uh, stuff in the brain, whatever it is, for full, rich, conscious experience. Well, I'm going to suggest it's microtubules. Um, and uh, these orchestrated selection subjects. Pardon me. Was that a question? No, I, I don't think so. It looks like someone was just on um, a mute. Um, such orchestrated selections would be neither random nor algorithmic, but non-computable. They would be 
influenced by uh, ro what Roger called platonic values. Uh, he said when these collapses occur, and depending on the amount of uh, platonic values, or excuse me, depending on the uh, amount of orchestration, they would be influenced by platonic values. So rather than being random, they would fall into uh, categories, maybe uh, even Jungian archetypes embedded in the fine scale structure of the universe or the Akashic record in Hindu uh, Vedic scriptures or uh, some other form of embedded information in, in the fine scale structure of the universe. Now, you know, this is a hypothesis that will be very uh, difficult to prove, but perhaps someday can be approached. But uh, uh, this would explain a lot or could explain a lot. Um, and, uh, but anyway, the more orchestrated, the more, the more like our consciousness uh, it becomes. And it could be if you're mindful and uh, don't act rashly that you could be influenced by platonic values or even uh, if you wanna put it in, in more spiritual terms, divine guidance, the following the way of the Tao or something like that. Uh, Roger shies away from anything uh, religious. So I, I shouldn't put words in his mouth, but many people have interpreted uh, what he says in that way. So can I just clarify super quick on um, uh, the idea of it being orchestrated then? And it's um, is it relationship to these platonic values. So say that there's um, an entangled field of microtubules and they all go through in a single moment in time, the, the wave function collapses. Would the specific platonic value that's say co-present or whatever the right phrase would be with that depend on the specific um, subatomic nature of that collapse. So I mean, whether or not it was a proton, an electron, the spin charge, color in the quarks, stuff like that. Well, I, I uh, skip over all that because I don't know enough particle physics or uh, supersymmetry or anything like that. And just, just say it's uh, space-time geometry. Um, so I, I don't know. It, 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 at some level, yes, but you know, uh, for my way of thinking at this point in time, I just think of it as space-time geometry. I actually have a slide somewhere of different representations of space-time geometry. Um, but, but so even down to quarks, that may be too big. You may have to go down to the Planck scale. But nobody knows. Uh, but we're, we're making that, that broad connection uh, at this point uh, without filling in the details. But it's still a big, you know, it's a big leap into the dark, you might say. But, um, you know, as I said, Roger is probably the world's expert on the, on the fine scale structure of space time geometry. Uh, twister theory being uh, his current uh, uh, mode. And, uh, you know, someday maybe we'll have a, uh, a theory of twisters and space time geometry and qualia. Um, but not yet. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, um, Roger needed a, uh, a quantum computer in the brain. And uh, uh, which could do the following: biologically orchestrate quantum information processing. So this is like the the orchestra going from individual musicians tuning up to the orchestra playing, uh, but without a conductor. Now, an orchestra has a conductor. This would be a, a kind of a uh, a, uh, a jam session or a uh, improv. Uh, there is no need for one one individual or one grandmother neuron orchestrating everything. So it'd be more uh, self-organizing, but still orchestrated. There's plenty of good music uh, that comes out of, without, without a, a conductor. They would have to halt or terminate by a Penrose objective reduction, connecting uh, the process to space-time geometry, non-computable platonic values, and qualia, awareness and feelings. And this, this relates in general uh, to James's uh, question, but without filling in any, any of the details. And, uh, they would have to regulate uh, functional neuronal and synaptic activities. Uh, there would have to be some kind of connection uh, to, uh, to the brain. And uh, it, this is tricky because a quantum system, if you perturb it, interact with it, you, you, just, you cause it to collapse. We think it's a, it's a sequence of alternating quantum, classical, quantum, classical, quantum, classical. So during the, the classical, there's input and output and during the quantum, there's the processing and then you have the consciousness. So anyway, uh, when I read uh, Roger's book, uh, he kind of put in at the end, like uh, he didn't know what the quantum computer might be. A neuron, both firing and not firing was, was too large, he realized. So he just put it out there as an open question. And when I read his book, I had been uh, studying microtubules for 20 years at that point. And it occurred to me, well, holy cow, he needs microtubules. 
And so I wrote to him and I said, uh, I told him about microtubules, which he didn't know about. And I sent him some papers I'd written and told him about the book I'd written. And uh, anyway, I mentioned I was going to be in England and he invited me to visit him, which I did. And uh, it was it was quite uh, quite an experience. And uh, he mentioned uh, right off that he was going to a conference on consciousness at Cambridge with uh, Dan Dennett and Pat Churchland, two of our major uh, critics. Uh, and uh, I he said, well, tell me about these microtubules. And so I spent, I, I did most of the talking. He just asked a few questions. And as you can tell, I can talk about microtubules ad nauseum, uh, some might say. But uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was particularly taken by the uh, uh, Fibonacci geometry of the uh, A lattice. Um, and uh, so we talked for hours. And he said, well, thank you very much. That was quite interesting. And so we shook hands. And I, I walked out. And I said, well, that was cool. I got to meet Roger Penrose. And I didn't think anything would come of it. And two weeks later, I was uh, flying home from England and uh, had dinner with a friend. He said, hey, I went to that meeting. I went to this meeting in Cambridge and Roger Penner was, was talking about you and your damn microtubules. And so I go, wow, that's interesting. And um, anyway, he, I subsequently got invited to a meeting in Sweden that it was obvious he had got me invited to. And uh, we started collaborating and I invited him to the first uh, consciousness conference in Tucson. Um, and uh, with a bribe of taking him to the Grand Canyon afterwards. And here we are at the Grand Canyon. And I should mention that uh, this was the first, the Science of Consciousness Conference in 1994, which we've done annually. And the next one is about a month from now. And I neglected to bring a, uh, a slide to tell you about it, but I'll, I'll send it along afterwards. It's gonna be pretty good, I think. Um, anyway, this is, uh, there's Roger, there's me. This is Dave Chalmers. Uh, Jeff Tollickson. Um, uh, anyway, uh, we started cooking up our Orca War scheme. Uh, here we are some years later. Uh, actually, this is 2011, where I'm being his bodyguard. He's being mobbed after giving a really interesting talk. And um, people tend to press up against them and so forth. So I was kind of keep an eye on them. And uh, anyway, um, we put forth our theory uh, of quantum computing and microtubules. But as uh, James, I think, mentioned in the intro, technological quantum computers require temperatures near absolute zero to avoid disruption by thermal decoherence. Everybody knows, everybody said, biology is too warm, wet, and noisy for seemingly delicate quantum effects. If you want to build a, a, a quantum computer, you got to do it at absolute zero with all this cryo equipment. And I've been, to, uh, I've been to Google's quantum computing lab, and sure enough, that's what they do. Uh, so how could biology do this at, at ambient temperatures? Uh, well, we thought, well, you know, biology has had a couple billion years to figure this out. And uh, I think that the answer is in the most basic level of biology, organic chemistry. And uh, organic chemistry, I think, is maybe the answer. So what do I mean by that? Um, in the 18th or 19th century, uh, chemists knew that there were hydrocarbons, alkanes, chains of carbon and hydrogen with this equation, CNH2N plus two, and they knew, all, they knew of the, these uh, compounds, or alkenes with a double bond with this formula, CNH2N, CNH2N. But then there was C6H6, so it would be CNHN, and they didn't know what the structure was. It was oily, it was flammable, um, but they didn't know the structure, and then one night, uh, August Kekulé, a German chemist, had a dream that these hydrocarbons were, were snakes, and one of them swallowed its tail, and he saw the Ouroboros, which is a mythical creature of a snake swallowing its tail, and he awoke to say, aha, benzene is a ring, and he was quite right, and there are three extra electrons here, and they form resonance structures that can be here, here, and here, or the opposite three corners, and um, or what more accurately, the electrons form uh, delocalized electron clouds above and below the uh, six carbon rings. And these electron clouds are quantum objects that support electric and magnetic dipole oscillations, excitons, uh, phonons, fluorescence, et cetera, et cetera. And it could, and th these are called pi resonance, pi, pi orbital 
uh, uh, resonance. Uh, and now it, if you take benzene and put it all together in a liquid, it's, it's uh, they're randomly interacting, that's gasoline, it's explosive. But if you take benzene and put it, for example, in a flat sheet, you get graphene, which has some very interesting quantum properties. Or if you put them at their, when they're arrayed at, at uh, slight separation, they have interesting quantum properties. Again, if you put it all together, it's gasoline, it's explosive. Not that interesting uh, for this purpose, but of course, essential for uh, our economy and so forth. Um, so um, these hexagonal uh, with uh, molecules, uh, uh, they're, they're nonpolar, they're neutral. They're not charged. The electrons uh, are in these nonpolar uh, electron clouds because they're anchored by the, the positive charged carbons. And um, if two of them are nearby, uh, they attract each other because the electrons here will repel the electrons here and you get di induced dipoles. So here's the electron cloud here, here's the electron cloud here. And they're like little bar magnets now and they attract and then they oscillate back and forth in terahertz, 10 to the 12th hertz. So again, if you space them properly, um, you're gonna get this, this oscillation um, uh, among them. And they can also form superposition and form a quantum bit or qubit of being in both possibilities. And what's really interesting to me anyway, is that um, anesthesia uh, blocks, uh, dampens these dipole offs, it disperses these dipoles. The anesthetic gases uh, form uh, their own dipole dispersion forces and, and block consciousness. And it could be at this level, uh, not with benzene, but, but in some uh, particular proteins uh, in the brain. It's also worth noting that psychoactive molecules have these aromatic rings. Pi, aromatic ring is another name for them, pi, pi resonance rings. And um, here, dopamine, the pleasure molecule, serotonin, the mood molecule, where we have a six and a five, an indole ring. And then in the psychedelics, where we have LSD with this uh, four, uh, four ring structure, DMT with the six and the five, psilocybin with the six and the five, and all of these are quite psychoactive. Um, and uh, almost all psychoactive molecules have, have these ring structures. So would they be psychoactive at the microtubules themselves? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we'll come back to that. I mean, everybody looks at the effects of, they, they do bind to serotonin receptors, and, uh, but they also are nonpolar and they're gonna get into the cell and there's increasing evidence that they do act, they, they could act on microtubules and would have the opposite effect of anesthetics. Rather than dampening the oscillations, we think they're gonna increase the oscillations. We have some, uh, there's some uh, uh, information on that that's proprietary. It's not my proprietary information, but um, somebody else's. So I can't really talk about it, but uh, there's at least a good hint that, that uh, um, uh, these molecules do get, get in the cell, bind to microtubules and may increase the, the uh, uh, quantum oscillation frequency. So the opposite of anesthesia. Anesthesia dampens and these would increase the oscillation frequency. It's very, very cool, thank you. You're welcome. Um, now there's also amphipathic molecules that have a aromatic ring and then a polar tail. And uh, dopamine is like this, the uh, uh, and aromatic amino acids, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. And the nonpolar uh, rings attract, just like I showed you before, due to the uh, uh, induced dipoles. And this is this forms what's called a micelle. And uh, operin uh, and haldane, back in the early part of the 20th century, thought this was the origin of life. That these formed these what call our operin micelles, with the nonpolar rings in the center and the polar rings sticking out. And you could see where this could, with a bunch more of these, form something like a cell with a polar exterior and a nonpolar interior. And this is exactly how proteins form. The aromatic amino acids kind of coalesce together and the, uh, the polar groups stick out. So it's, the proteins are soluble in blood and water and fluids, but have a nonpolar water resistant uh, uh, interior. Oral and water don't mix. And I think this is the key to how quantum effects occur in biology. It's not uh, wet in there. There's no water. It's nonpolar, and uh, it's it may be warm, but the warmth is used to pump coherently, warm wet, and it's not noisy because it's coherent. So uh, this is how we avoid the warm wet and noisy question. I think by being inside these nonpolar groups, 
um, which are not only in proteins, but in lipid bilayers in the interior and in the pie stacks and nucleic acids. And um, we've coined this term, the, so it pervades biological uh, systems in, in all types of biomolecules. And Travis Craddock came up with the term, the, the quantum underground, uh, that it's, it, it, so there may be this quantum stuff going on in all these biomolecules deep within their structure. And we know that they support uh, quantum activities. For example, uh, this was done in 2003 at Santa Barbara. There are these quantum dots connected by these benzene rings. And you put energy into there and you get it out there. Uh, you put quantum spin. And the quantum spin is transferred through these benzene rings. And it is increased with temperature. The warmer it is, the more efficient there's quantum transfer. And this shows the uh, quantum spin transfer superposition here. So. Um, Temperature doesn't, doesn't bother them that uh, it actually increases the quantum state, the quantum process in this event. Uh, this is the uh, photosynthesis protein that, uh, that helped turn this whole uh, idea around. In 2006, it was discovered that um, photosynthesis uses quantum coherence. Photons are absorbed here, transferred through this protein to get to here where food is made, chemical energy is made by going through these chromophores, which are pi resonance groups, all seven at the same time in quantum superposition. And these, these seven are very similar to the uh, array to the uh, tryptophans in tubulin. Um, I'm jumping ahead there. Um, and if you do uh, 2D electron spectroscopy of that protein, you get these sawtooth inter interference waves uh, indicative of, uh, of quantum superposition. So uh, these pi resonance groups inside proteins do have uh, quantum superposition states. Okay, well, what about tubulin? Tubulin, the uh, component protein of microtubules, has 86 of these pi resonance groups, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine, shown here in, in color-coded. And in the red, you see where anesthetics bind. And they're right in, in the non, because they're nonpolar also, they're gonna bind in the same, the same area. And this is from Travis Craddock, uh, work I'm uh, part of our group uh, in 2012. And um, then in 2017, we did uh, this study um, where we, we took tubulin, the uh, same, same one, and we modeled quantum dipole oscillations among all 86 pi resonance rings in tubulin and a very big computer back east. Uh, I think it, it was at Johns Hopkins where Curian is, and, or Howard University, excuse me, and uh, a supercomputer. And because 86 in, in, interaction, e each one's interacting with the other 85. Uh, though we emphasize, uh, um, and then, so what do you get when you, you model these quantum dipole oscillations? You get a spectrum of collective dipole oscillations in the terahertz, I mentioned terahertz, with a common mode peak right there at 613 terahertz. And uh, we then added the anesthetics and uh, the anesthetics uh, dampened, um, we, we added eight different anesthetics uh, actually, uh, this is, this is uh, methoxyfluorine, not methamphetamine. This is halothane, uh, n-fluorine, isofluorine, sevofluorine, diethyl ether, and nitrous oxide. So all the anesthetics uh, dampen, uh, abolish this 613 terahertz peak and dampen all the others. And these TFMP and F6 are non-anesthetics, uh, which didn't, didn't change it. So uh, that's what we showed in this paper. Another paper that Travis uh, and his group did showed super radiance and subradiance in microtubules. And here you see the, the photon can actually, a photon can actually occupy, uh, remember photons like 500, 600 nanometers long, and it can actually uh, be distributed along the microtubule. Here's the, the nine, uh, so, sorry, the 13 tubulins in a microtubule. Uh, I'm, uh, this, this is work in progress progress and we're looking, uh, James mentioned that we're looking at the anesthetic effects uh, on quantum effects and uh, we'll be presenting that at the Tucson conference and this will be uh, part of it. We think actually the subradiant is, is probably the quantum state and it goes away with, with anesthesia. So we're, we're, the preliminary results look very promising that the anesthetics are uh, dampening the, uh, the uh, quantum effects that we see in the microtubules, which are quantum optical effects. I think the quantum optical effects are going to be very important. But getting back to the model that Roger and I developed um, to simplify all this, instead of the 86, 
we use this uh, simplified tube lens with only, uh, uh, I think, nine uh, uh, aromatic rings so that we could have dipole, uh, dipoles going different direction. So the basic idea of the model was that we take, uh, th these are all continuous, and uh, would this, this quantum state would go from tubulin to tubulin and wrap around the microtubule in the A lattice and form this, this extended, uh, extended dipole, uh, long range dipole coupling, or what Froelich called uh, uh, Froelich giant dipoles. And uh, uh, here's Froelich. Uh, Froelich had this idea in the 70s of biological quantum coherence based on pumping by energy emanating from the nonpolar regions uh, inside uh, proteins. He was thinking membrane proteins, but when I met him in 1986, I suggested microtubules and I told him about them and he thought they would be good candidates also. And he uh, predicted that uh, driven by ambient temperature, you, uh, so rather than being destroyed by temperature, you would, if you had a proper geometric lattice, it had to be something with some resonant properties, uh, you get coherent dipole oscillations in terahertz, gigahertz, and or megahertz uh, arising in these nonpolar pi resonance regions in geometrical lattices. So um, that was a great uh, theoretical contribution. Um, and uh, we used it in, and in our theory, I'll come back to that in a second, uh, the idea that we get increasing number of uh, superposition tubulins, E sub G reach threshold, and at this particular time, there's a moment of conscious experience. It wouldn't be just from one microtubule, it would be from many. And I'll come back to that point. Now, here's some actual evidence for what I've been saying. This was done by uh, Honor Bandyapadye uh, and his group. Um, and he looked at uh, neurons and microtubules with three different scales. So this is the largest scale. Here's a neuron and here's another neuron. And these things are elect nanoprobes that he's putting into measure and uh, measure and stimulate. Now, uh, and then here's an individual single microtubule with uh, 10 electrodes. And here's a row of tubulins with four electrodes. So this is really a uh, high level uh, nano nanobiotechnology. And what, so if you just take a single microtubule and, uh, and measure its conductivity, it's, it's an insulator, it doesn't conduct at all. However, if you apply uh, alternating current and sweep the frequency, th which is what Honorbon did at three different scales, you find, or he found that at specific frequencies, you'll get highly conductive ballistic conductance occurring. And at the level, uh, and he found this, and I'll start at the lowest level. He found this in terahertz, 10 to the 12th Hertz, or hundreds of terahertz, gigahertz, uh, 10 to the ninth, megahertz, 10 to the sixth, and then moving up to the microtubule, he saw gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz, and then at the whole level of whole neurons, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz. And each one of these signals was what he called a triplet of triplets. So there's three peaks in each of these, and each peak has three peaks. So these triplets of triplets were found uh, at all three scales, stem, uh, spanning from terahertz all the way to hertz. And in fact, in our 2014 paper, uh, Roger and I suggested that EEG, which is in Hertz, uh, is actually uh, due to beat frequencies of microtubule oscillations from inside all those neurons. And people, uh, you know, if, if you read uh, Busaki's book, for example, on EEG, um, th there's no one common mechanism. You know, it's like, well, this, band, this frequency comes from this network and this comes from this. We don't really know about gamma. There's still no good explanation for it. So we put that forth and people said, ah, blah, 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 it can't be right. But I haven't, still haven't heard a, uh, a better explanation. So it could be that EEG is, is due to B frequencies of, of higher frequency oscillations in microtubules. Anyway, this is uh, Honorbond's uh, results. So let me, a little bit about quantifying ORCA-WAR. Um, there's 10 to the eighth, 10 to the ninth tubulins per neuron about 10 to the 19th to 20th tubulins in a human brain. And by E sub G equals H bar over T. Uh, our original idea was that we should, you know, T would have to be in the range of cognition like uh, uh, alpha, free, alpha EEG or, or gamma EEG. But this would require a long decoherence time to avoid decoherence. 
and would it turns out would require would involve only a small number of of tubulins like one to ten neurons worth which didn't make make sense so we had two problems we had to fight decoherence and it was only involved in a small small part of the brain so in 2014 in our paper we we uh we went a different route and said orco wire events must must be much faster and uh let's say 10 megahertz, 10 to, the, 10 to the 7 hertz or 10 to the minus 7 seconds. This gives a very short decoherence time and Honorbaum's work already showed that microtubules can remain quantum coherent for that long. And uh, this would require about 10 to the 15th tubulins, about a 10,000th or 100,000th of brain capacity, which made more sense for, for, uh, for the amount involved in any one conscious moment. It would be a different fraction every, every conscious moment. But this seemed to make more sense. Uh, we, we totally avoided the problem of decoherence. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's our current model. So, um, however, 10, minus, 10 megahertz is too fast for cognition and consciousness. Our uh, cognitive epochs tend to be several hundred milliseconds. Um, but uh, interference waves, interference patterns from terahertz to gigahertz to megahertz to kilohertz, the beat frequencies that I mentioned earlier, could resonate across scale and evolve to reach threshold at time t equals h, uh, h bar over e sub g. So it's the beat frequencies that give rise to the cognitive epics and EEG. But the brain is actually operating under the hood, you might say, at a much faster frequency. So this is the basis of this scale invariant hierarchy going down. Again, other people go, go up. Uh, and it certainly it does go up, but we're just looking at going down all the way down to the to the Planck scale. And our, our uh, I'm just running out of time here. So um, our view of the, uh, of the hard problem would be that uh, the red rose is, uh, is not as conventional theories would say a pattern of brain activity, or MRI or EEG, but rather the, the specific cur curvature of space-time geometry, much more than three curvatures would be reproduced in her brain or maybe uh, entangled with her brain. So um, the last section I want to talk about is uh, which came first, consciousness or life? Uh, neuroscience, psychology, and most Western philosophy would say that life preceded consciousness. Consciousness emerged from life. Uh, however, panpsychists, naturalists, Eastern philosophers, spiritualists, whitehead, uh, objective reduction, people would say that consciousness preceded life that life emerged from consciousness. So rather than the brain uh, uh, e e emerging and evolving and then consciousness happening out of that, the brain, the consciousness was there, uh, was there first in this view. So we can ask the question, when did consciousness arise? Here's the, the, the Big Bang. Um, and uh, some people would say uh, fairly recently with tools or language. Um, <clears throat> some people would say with <clears throat> the advent of animal cells, eukaryotes first life or even before the Big Bang, Roger has this idea of serial, the, uh, serial eons. And so consciousness might've uh, been in the previous eon possibly and may even have crossed over in some sense. Um, so it's possible uh, that, that consciousness was there first. And in fact, um, if that were the case, um, uh, how would that affect the origin of life? Well, the life on earth apparently began in a primordial soup proposed by Oppen and Haldane, a simmering mix from which biomolecules emerge, or maybe thermal vents, Dahmer and others suggest that. But uh, either way, um, um, <clears throat> you get amphipathic molecules. In the 50s, Miller and Ure simulated a primordial soup and found organic amphipathic molecules. They had all the, the ingredients, they had uh, uh, electrical activity, uh, photons and so forth. And what they found was amphipathic molecules, very much like dopamine or the aromatic amino acids. And uh, uh, now it could be, I'm gonna digress here a little bit that um, these aromatic rings have only a couple, two stable configurations, whether T-shaped or offset parallel and a metastable state, which could be a, a, a superposition state. So this is purely conjecture, but maybe one particular, if this collapses to this, uh, you get one type of feeling. And if this collapses to this, you get another uh, type of feeling, uh, happy, joy, uh, pleasure, so to speak. Now, obviously this, people would say, well, you're, 
anthropomorphizing or whatever that word is. But quality have to come from somewhere. And, uh, you know, maybe it's the fundamental level of the universe. And maybe this particular configuration uh, resonates with that a particular structure. I don't know, but uh, it's possible that that something as something like this could give rise to primitive feelings. So that back in the primordial soup, there were a number of these which reached threshold and had a conscious moment, uh, most of which would be random, but some uh, would be positive. Uh, in other words, feel good. And this, uh, well, I showed you that already. Uh-oh, uh-oh. So um, some would be positive and feel good. Uh, and with pleasure as a feedback fitness function orienting pi resonance group, the question, did life then evolve to orchestrate and optimize OR mediated pleasure? And I call this the quantum pleasure principle borrowing without permission from Freud's uh, beyond the pleasure principle. And um, now Dar Darwin is a pillar of science, but the notion that life evolved behavior to promote gene survival, like as Dawkins would say, Darwin never said that, Dawkins says that, you know, uh, as the selfish gene is an assumption. So I'm disagreeing with Dawkins, but not Darwin, that's what I'm trying to say, is an assumption It doesn't make sense. Behavior is driven by reward, uh, pleasure, avoiding pain. There were no genes in the primordial soup. So how do we get from the primordial soup to simple organisms? And evolutionary theory ignores consciousness and feelings. Uh, and uh, life and consciousness might have come from interstellar uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which I skipped over. I'll come back to that. So did feelings drive evolution? This is known as the phenomenal argument in evolution. Uh, my friend Dante Loretta is an astronomer who's interested in the origin of life from extraterrestrial sources, and he's in charge of a big mission that sent a probe to an asteroid that's bringing back carbonaceous materials that had these polyaromatic hydrocarbons, the pi resonance groups that I've been talking about. And some of them are very complex and intricate. And uh, um, so that's what this ending is for. But um, uh, the search for life and consciousness in the universe would benefit from understanding what life is here. And uh, um, well, let's see. Well, I'm afraid I, I've lost the other conclusion, but let me just say that I think you have to go inside the neurons, the microtubules, you've got to go to the quantum level and go down to the uh, fundamental level of the universe. And the last thing I want to say before questions is that you can potentially treat uh, mental and cognitive disorders of the microtubules with a therapy called uh, uh, transcranial ultrasound, which puts ultrasound into the brain and resonates the microtubules. Uh, my colleague Jay Sanguinetti has done a number of studies on this. There was a recent study that showed that Alzheimer's patients benefited from it. And that's, uh, it seems to be the, the best uh, uh, non-invasive uh, mode for uh, stimulant uh, brain modulation uh, at this point. And the last thing is the conference coming up. I'll send a separate thing about that. So thank you. I'm sorry I, uh, I lost the last few slides, but uh, I'll be happy to take some questions. It's all good. Thank you so much. It was absolutely brilliant. I'm sure I can say that. On behalf of everyone who's present, thank you. All right, so uh, Foster, do you want to go for it, mate? Hey, um, I'm Foster Ellis. First of all, thank you, Professor Hammeroff. And I was wondering if there's anything which would prevent there being more than one orchestrated objective reduction happening simultaneously in the brain. Because like it doesn't, as far as I understand, it doesn't take up the whole brain. So you could have like a network of neurons all quantumly interacting and having an orchestrated objective reduction in one spot. Would it be possible to have another one happening simultaneously in a different spot? Or is there anything in the model which would prevent that? Uh, I don't think there's anything in the model. I could certainly see that happening in a split brain patient, you know, where the corpus callosum is sliced and they have two different personalities. Um, it could be that uh, some of these some of these are sub threshold and then they kind of co coalesce into one collapse. So I don't I, I can't say for sure. Um, maybe you know in some disease entities, schizophrenia or or multiple. Well, I don't even know about that. Uh, it's possible. I tend to think that under normal circumstances, the superpositions will entangle and coalesce until they reach threshold. And then um, 
each superposition is going to reach threshold at a slightly different time. So that may avoid the problem of having multiple consciousnesses at the same time. I don't know for sure, but, but I suspect that, that under normal circumstances, entanglement would reach threshold and we have one major, uh, one conscious moment at, at any one time. Because you know, time is, you can really, it could be a, a tiny fraction of a second. We're talking uh, 10 million per second. So one can happen shortly after the other. Okay. I didn't really Thank answer. You, it. I, I don't know for sure. Yeah. Good question. Well, the, the reason that I'm thinking of that is there's a, in like various psychoanalytic thoughts, there's ideas of if the unconscious is truly actually unconscious or if it is conscious, but like conscious to a lesser degree. And sometimes you can have the some people will suggest that you've got like your ordinary conscious mind, which would be like the most conscious you could say. And then you could have like a dissociated different bit of consciousness, which is like less conscious. And both of those would be like doing their own things. So if you could have like one main stream of consciousness say, and then have potentially multiple lesser degrees of consciousness going on in different places of the brain, because it's like, it's, unsure and not really settled if it's actually conscious or if it's like a philosophical zombie and i was thinking if we start from the or our theory we could come at the question from a different angle yeah a uh, little bit more context yeah um well the uh the subconscious could be remain quantum and contribute you know if you're looking for uh subconscious drives like freud or uh young or uh, maybe uh that remains it could remain quantum you're saying could that be conscious it wouldn't need to be conscious to have an influence on 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 thought uh it could be incorporated into the consciousness or it could be incorporated into your actions without ever reaching consciousness uh so i don't know the answer for sure um but uh you know i i think uh the quantum i think um the quantum subconscious is a good possibility in fact um uh, I, I remember uh, a, a book by uh, Mate Blanco talking about um, the quant uh, analyzing uh, dreams. And uh, he came up with a number of uh, 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 properties of the logic of dreams that were different from the logic of waking life. And uh, they were very much like quantum, quantum physics. And I can't remember the details, but uh, I remember writing uh, something about that. Uh, about the uh, quantum logic of dreams and the quantum subconscious that could either reach threshold for collapse, as you're suggesting, or be incorporated and entangled into uh, a, you know, a, a more global uh, conscious moment uh, and collapse. So uh, either way, the quantum logic uh, of the subconscious uh, could, uh, could play a role. And um, I'd have to go back and look at Mate Blanco's characteristics. He was, an, I think, an Argentine uh, South American psychologist that uh, somebody turned me on to. And uh, his, uh, he has something about uh, the quantum logic of dreams or the logic of dreams that my, myself and, and some other people think uh, looks very much like quantum logic or is similar to quantum logic. Awesome. Thank you very much. It's just one more hand up at the moment, and that's Jacob. Do you want to go for it, Jacob? Hey, thanks, and thank you, Professor Hammeroff, for taking the time to speak to us today. Uh, that was very fascinating and engaging. Um, my name is Jacob Mattern. I'm up in Canada. Uh, I have a question around entropy and its relationship to microtubules. I heard you mention at one point that uh, microtubules kind of arrange themselves against entropy or against the second law of uh, thermodynamics in some senses. I know you go deeper into that, but I'm wondering if uh, in a, at a daily day-to-day -day life, how that relationship between entropy and microtubules might impact uh, a person and their maybe feelings, felt sense of homeostasis potentially. Um, yeah, just the relationship between entropy and microtubules. Thanks. Well, um... Microtubules self-organize from individual tubulants. Uh, and it, it appears that you get these beautiful uh, cylindrical lattice structures 
um, from disorder. And it would appear that you're going against the second law. But what the explanation is that um, um, if you take individual tubulins, it has a lot of ordered water around it. Okay, it's coated with ordered water. And then when it assembles into a microtubule, it has a lot less ordered water um, because it's, it's interfacing with the other tubulins and the ordered water is markedly reduced. And the ordering of the water is order and it's the opposite of entropy. So when you go from all these individual tubulins with a lot of, each with a lot of ordered water into a lattice structure um, that has more order, you're actually uh, going with the law of thermodynamics. It's a very clever ploy by nature uh, to do that. If you're asking how we deal as conscious beings with disorder in the universe, I'm not sure. I, it's something <laughs> we're all fighting at every day, um, one way or the other, uh, if that's what you meant. But um, um, it, the, it, it's, it's a trick of, of water ordering to avoid the, uh, uh, to, to get uh, self-polymerization of microtubules. For sure, thank you. And yeah, I was wondering if there's any way that at the microtubule level, you can measure a sense of uh, disorder, if that's even a thing. And then that, that was my, where I went into um, its effect on the daily experience of consciousness. And if there's any relationship there, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my colleague and friend Dante Loretta, the astronomer guy, is really into entropy. And uh, he's always saying we got to look at entropy. So um, I, I don't have a better answer than, than, than that. But, but that's, you know, we may, uh, that's something we, we're going to try to look at in the future. Awesome. Thank you very much. Cheers. All right. Um, do you go first? Scott? Hello. Scotty. Hello. Hello. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see me or not because I can't see myself. I see you. You got a red sweater oh, okay. on. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Scotty. Um, thank you, Professor Hemroth. Um, so at the, towards the end there, James Dowling asked a question. You were talking about frequencies and microtubules and how it was possible psychedelic drugs and meditative states affected the microtubules. My question was relating music to microtubules. Is it possible, because I know music works with frequencies and sound, is, is it possible biologically that it's lining up with the way consciousness works in a sense, that it's actually affecting us at the microtubule level, that music is doing that and it's changing things? And that's, that's that felt sense of pleasure. Could you just elaborate on that? Is it like, in a sense, you don't need... The, psych the psychedelics and the music could be doing the same thing, affecting the same parts of the, that system. That was my question, just writing the music. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I would say that I think consciousness is more like music than it is like a computation. And the brain is more like an orchestra than it is a computer, at least an orchestra without a conductor. Um, and it could, it could be that we like you know, certain music, certain songs, because they resonate our brains and specifically resonate our microtubules uh, in, in, a, in a way that's pleasurable. And, uh, you know, I love music and uh, it makes me feel good. Most music, some music may, is disturbing. Um, but um, uh, I think, it's, I think uh, it can resonate certain patterns and, you know, overtones and harmonics and, and all that. Uh, I'm not very musical myself, so I can't really elaborate. But uh, uh, as far as the psychedelics, I, I think that, uh, and, and meditation, if you increase the, the vibrations, the quantum vibrations, you're going to get higher frequencies and, you, and you're going to get more interactions and more, more richness in, uh, in, of conscious experience and uh, deeper levels like we saw with the, uh, uh, the uh, hidden, hidden networks in, in AI even but except this would be biological. So yeah, I think music uh, can induce pleasure by resonating the microtubules, maybe quite literally resonating the microtubules to the music. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Scotty. Hello, John. Hi, um, thank you, Professor Amaroff. Uh, my name is John, I'm a student here at IPSA. I have 
a bit more of a broader based question. Uh, but in the beginning of your lecture, you spoke about consciousness being considered an epiphenomena um, and that we're not necessarily in quote unquote control of some of the rapid fire activities that we experience as being under conscious control. Um, when you were speaking about it, it reminded me of the word association test that we use here at I IPSA, um, which is developed by Carl Jung and Franz Rickland. Um, and in the test is in essence based on the notion that the rapid fire associations that are given are not under conscious control. Um, and they were used to um, view complexes that, that Jung had spoke about in some detail. I was curious to know if you had any thoughts um, on that matter uh, at all. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, the, one problem I have with the idea that uh, we're answering at a subconscious level uh, is as opposed to uh, um, answering uh, automatically and consciousness happens later, is that the we can measure the activity for the consciousness happening later. I'm not aware of seeing the activity in real time. So in other words, if you, if you answer immediately, maybe you know the answer to this, I don't know. Is there, is there brain activity that's happening at that immediate time? That, that I'm not sure of, I, I just. Yeah, I, I don't know either. I mean, that, that's a very interesting question because um, uh, I've always said, you know, uh, and this goes back to the work of Libet that I didn't have time to, to talk about, but, um, you know, where uh, in the libid volitional experiments, move your finger and there's a, an activity beforehand, um, but, uh, but that's still not happening. That, that's before the actual event happens. So I don't know the answer to that, whether it's subconscious. I, I can see the, the point of the question that you're getting. It could be that it's, it's conscious, but, but less filtered. Um, that, you know, uh, Libet talked about the, the, the conscious veto that, you know, uh, purpose conscious might be to uh, uh, inhibit you from doing things that you would re otherwise regret. So maybe that's coming into the, the word association there. Um, but I don't know. That's, that's a good question. I'll have to think about that. Okay, maybe you. if you find out whether there's activity that correlates with the immediate response, uh, I'd like to know that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure of that, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. It looks like that's all the questions. Uh, Steve and Pauline, are you there? Oh, somebody has a question. Oh, that's right. Janik, do you want to go for it, mate? Yes, I do. Um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Hammerall, for um, taking your time and explaining your theory. Um, what I wanted to ask you is um, you mentioned ultrasound for healing and mental disorders, especially Alzheimer's as well. And in the presentation before, um, you also mentioned schizophrenia um, um, and it's like um, the defective transport of CMR2 leads to dispersed um, F acting and then to and schizoph um, schizophrenia. And my question is be like on a chemical level, um, the disorders are different, but like um, my question at the end is actually, um, does the ultrasound therapy work for both, um, like could work for both for um, potentially for um, um, Alzheimer's and for schizophrenia or other mental disorders as such? Because like the correlate is like the waves as such. Um, for instance, um, like the wave, if you, <laughs> I mean, let's say if you take like psychoactive drugs, the waves would be like matching with like like some um, meditative states, and then yeah. So that's like my question. I'm not sure if it's it's quite unstructured, but well, I I don't know. Uh, we haven't done any work with uh, schizophrenia. Uh, the the work uh, that that we've done. Uh, my colleagues, Jay Sanguinetti, John Allen, Ezra Smith, and a few other people, mostly with mood and depression. And, uh, and uh, but a recent study from Harvard uh, came out with Alzheimer's because uh, there's some evidence in cell culture that ultrasound, well, the, the whole point of this is that ultrasound is megahertz. And when, uh, when Anurban discovered this terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, 
I started thinking, well, what, which of these might be useful therapeutically? And terahertz is visible as uh, photons, it's hard to get in. Uh, gigahertz is uh, uh, microwave, megahertz is radio waves, but um, uh, megahertz in mechanical vibration is ultrasound. And in anesthesia, we use ultrasound all the time for imaging, uh, for line placements and so forth. So I was quite familiar with it. And uh, I looked up to see if anybody had tried ultrasound into the brain and in, uh, in animals they had, and uh, they had shown uh, uh, physiological effects, behavioral effects. And so, and it was also approved for imaging. So I figured it had to be fairly safe, uh, brain imaging, but of course, CT and MRI are much better now. So um, I, we have uh, chronic, we see chronic pain patients and they tend to be depressed. So I suggested to my uh, uh, anesthesia colleagues that we should try ultrasound on our chronic pain patients. And they said, yeah, you go first, you know, you try, you got a nice shaved head there, uh, your idea, go for it. And so they kind of called me off. And uh, so uh, I did, and I, I put the ultrasound up to my, my head. You got to put this goop on it to get a good uh, contact. And um, I, for about 15 seconds, and I didn't feel anything. So I was a little disappointed. Um, but about a minute later, I started to feel kind of a buzz and was was buzzed for about an hour or two. And so uh, uh, we did a study and published the first study in 2013 in brain stimulation on effects of transcranial ultrasound on, on mental states. Uh, but it was just uh, mood, mood scores and that sort of thing. Uh, Jay and his group has done a lot more. In 2020, we have, a, uh, and I'll be happy to send you this, this paper, a paper on uh, 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 showing enhanced mood and uh, changes in MRI con connectivity. So there's actual change in the brain induced by the, by the ultrasound. And uh, more, and uh, because Alzheimer's has the, your uh, 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 microtube is falling apart, uh, I've been wanting to do that, but uh, uh, the group at Harvard uh, beat us to it. And they're gonna be presenting that at the, at the, at the consciousness conference. So uh, Alzheimer's, I think it's worth trying. Depression, yes. Schizophrenia, I don't know. Um, Jay's also been looking at uh, focused ultrasound on certain areas that cause meditative, seem to do some mindfulness and meditative states. So uh, I think the future's uh, uh, quite bright for ultrasound. And the, the editor of the journal Brain Stimulation recently came out and said that of, all, of the various modalities, transcranial magnetic, transcranial electrical, alternating and direct photons, that ultrasound may be the best. It's certainly the safest, it's the easiest to deal with, uh, and it's totally painless. So um, I, I think that's going to continue. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. Thank you very much. Hello, Professor Hamaroff. Hello there. Thank you for taking the time today. Um, you know, my question is a, a bit personal. It seems as though uh, this pursuit in this career must have been uh, quite an enjoyable one, chasing all of these uh, dimensions in consciousness. Um, I'm wondering if on the topic of whether consciousness is a phenomenon or it's a pre-existent aspect of this reality. I'm curious, uh, where do you fall on that, on that question? And also, um, if it is something that's pre-existent or that it's a phenomenon, um, if you believe there is any intent of its own or any such um, intelligible or discernible pathology? Um, well, I think it's, uh, I, I, I don't think it's epiphenomenal. I think consciousness, uh, you know, if you follow uh, Roger Penrose's idea, objective reduction has been happening all along. It's a matter of when it got organized. So I gave that little scenario in the primordial soup, uh, or maybe in, in extraterrestrial space in the, in the uh, poly, in the interstellar dust that we see on that slide. Um, and I think um, I think the, the the purpose is to optimize pleasure, and uh, but pleasure can be it can be hedonistic pleasure. It can be altruistic, spiritual, love. It doesn't have to be uh, something uh, you know hedonistic. It can be something uh, like I said, altruistic or spiritual or something something very positive, and. Uh, We've even conjectured that, you know, Roger has this idea of the, of the e eons ending 
uh, due to entropy running out, or, or maybe it's the other way around, I forget. And then another eon. And the crossover point, you know, what happens to consciousness from eon to eon? We've talked about this. And it could be that, that each transi uh, transition is, is a uh, kind of like a, a chance to uh, evolve and mutate or mutate and evolve. And so maybe consciousness is the serial universes are serving to optimize consciousness. Um, if consciousness is, is able to do that, it would seem to be a, a, good, uh, a good mode, uh, uh, you know, to optimize consciousness. In other words, the purpose of the universe is to optimize consciousness. That's going way, way out on, on a couple more limbs. But um, if there's going to be any purpose uh, to the universe and consciousness, that, that would be it, to optimize consciousness to hopefully for altruistic, uh, you know, peaceful purposes. Um, but so overall pleasure versus, uh, displeasure, I guess that's my own personal feeling. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. I've just got one final question, if that's all right, professor. Sure. That's sweet. So, uh, the, it goes back to that phosphorylation point that you mentioned about halfway through or so, and I'm thinking about these studies. There've been loads of them that have been done, of course, but studies in mice, that say, okay, here's the, um, here's the amygdala. Here's a part of the amygdala, which seems to encode information to do with learned fear. And here's another part that encodes um, innate fear. So there's obviously gonna be intracellular pathways to do with that. And they've, they've obviously looked at these and said, okay, you can upregulate certain receptors and you can get more of a particular fear coming through. So my general question was, um, and again, goes back to the phosphorylation point, what the potential interactions there could be presumably we wouldn't know at the moment, but could be between the microtubules and the wider proteomic state. So in other words, the microtubules, they, they, they can be involved, as you pointed out, and your work has demonstrated in these neuronal firings, they're involved in structure, but could they also be involved in other things too? And perhaps therefore other, say, genomic information being expressed can then go forward and influence those. So you've got kind of a dynamic informational system at play there. Yeah, uh, well, the, uh, you know, microtubules control, regulate a lot of stuff that goes on, including the, the transport that's going to, uh, you know, determine which proteins are present at the synapses and so forth. Uh, presumably, they could even go back and, and change, uh, well, they, they can change genetic expression for sure um, in that type of mechanism and, uh, you know, uh, modify other proteins that would be necessary for, for, you know, everything that you just said. Um, so uh, the amygdala, for example, if, if it's going to be more responsive to a particular fear, uh, that sounds like a memory, or that is a memory. And, and so, you know, it goes back to the question of memory, and it's not necessarily in the synapses, but in the, uh, you know, in the cytoskeleton itself, particularly in the, in the dendrites, where the memory is formed, and that would determine the response of that uh, amygdala cell or the amygdala in general to a particular fear. So uh, I, I think uh, they certainly could, could regulate that, yes. So in, in, in summary then, um, an, um, an intracellular or quantum event that's synonymous with consciousness could feasibly directly influence gene expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, gene expression changes all the time from various things, so uh, yeah. In fact, uh, if you know, that's how they figured out uh, uh, the gene expression, well, uh, with anesthetics, change the gene expression of tubulin, for example, it, too much anesthesia. So yeah, I mean, that, that, happen, that's, that happens all the time with gene expression in various scenarios. So I, I don't see why it wouldn't happen with changes in the cytoskeleton. Brilliant, okay, thank you. Uh, I, I see that, that Dean's put his, his hand up. Is it all right if Dean asks a question as well? Sure, sure. hey, Dean. Oh, yes. Hello, Professor Hemroff. Thank you so much for the presentation, sir. Um, yeah, just have a quick question here. And if I could uh, get Stephen Pauline's input as well, hopefully we can tie this in. And I know in our study, we spent the first year in learning about hypnosis. And I know from um, in your background in uh, anesthesia, I know that doctors use hypnosis prior to the invention of anesthesia to perform surgeries on patients. So I was wondering if that's something, uh, again, Stephen Pauline, that we can measure um, as far as the state of consciousness under a trance state. Could you measure what the microtubules are doing or 
the activities in that state? Or if that's something that you'd be curious to look into. Um, yeah, it would be, but you know, if you're, if you're asking to look at the quantum state of a microtubule inside a brain of a human while he or she is, is doing something, that's pretty tricky. In fact, uh, we had, uh, we're part of the uh, Templeton uh, uh, program in uh, uh, accelerating research and consciousness, pitting different theories against each other. And we went up against uh, in integrated information theory with Christoph Koch and uh, Giulio Tononi. And what they wanted to do would, was um, in a monkey uh, whose thalamus would be stimulated to measure the quantum states of the microtubules in the brain of that monkey. And I said, you know, we are hopeful to be able to measure that in a single microtubule in a cuvette or in a, in a Petri dish or a test tube. To do that, you know, because it requires a quantum optical bench and, and all kinds of lasers and, and, you know, motion. I don't know if you've ever been in a quantum optics lab, but they go to great lengths to avoid vibration. So the idea of doing that in a, in a, in a live uh, monkey who might be squirming around uh, didn't, didn't seem feasible. Uh, and so we didn't get that adversarial collaboration. Templeton gave us money to just do our own uh, studies. So the question you're asking would be along those lines. Now, having said that in the future, who knows what's possible? It may be that we'll have probes that can do that. Um, but at this point in time, no. And uh, I'm, I'm more into looking at, uh, you know, in, microtubules in vitro uh, detecting quantum effects and looking at effects of anesthesia and or psychedelics on them in, in, a, in a simple single microtubule and then go from there into cell culture and do it in a neuron and then maybe a neural network and then eventually maybe somehow in a human uh, but that, that's a ways off. Thanks Dean, thank you. Okay, I think it's I think it's probably best to close up there, Professor Hammeroff. But thank you so 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 much for hosting today's seminar. It's been a huge pleasure, um, hugely informative, uh, and I hope I can speak for all, all all the guys here. All right, Stephen Pauling, see you popped up on the screen. Yes, uh, that was stunning. Uh, the implications for our field. It's uh, talk about not being able to compute. Well, I, I cannot compute the, the the implications of your work for our field going forward and for this this younger generation of students coming through. And it's a heartfelt thanks from both of us. Oh, it's, it's just it's absolutely fascinating. Been an incredible yes. privilege. Yes. And thank you so much for your time and obvious curve for going over time yes. for the people that you've been communicating with today. So thank you, Professor Hammeroff. Thank you so yes. much yeah. thank on, you. on behalf of us all. Well, thank you. You guys are a great audience. I appreciate it very much. Good luck to you. And, uh, I'll send you something about the conference and uh, something about ultrasound. Thank if you, you. I'll, I'll just send it to Steve since I have his contact. Thank you so much. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day, you guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.